So we got a billboard in Times Square. It is massive. It is, it's got two sides. And it reads, Taylor Lorenz doxed at libs of TikTok. And we did this because Taylor Lorenz, a journalist for the Washington Post, wielded institutional power like a cudgel to target people that she did not like. The framing of the story she did that doxed libs of TikTok was libs of TikTok. TikTok was that <laughs> libs of TikTok is bad. Okay. Now, I think that reporting is great. We should know what is the motivation behind libs of TikTok. And depending on who the person is behind it, maybe we should know who they are. Turns out it was kind of a random person. So publishing the name served nothing in the story. So I am critical of Taylor Lorenz for publishing the name, but think the reporting was merited. Taylor Lorenz then released private home information and work information of this individual, which I condemn. Taylor Lorenz then lied about it on TV and the Washington Post lied about it. So I said, okay, you want to wield institutional power against regular people or against people, you know, people to cause harm. I can wield institutional power too. So with the help of Jeremy Boring, co-CEO of the Daily Wire and the Daily Wire crew, we got this billboard up very quickly. So we'll talk all about that story as well as a whole bunch of other stuff. The, um, the top lawyer for Twitter, Vijaya Gade, the person that I actually spoke with on the Joe Rogan podcast, cried in a meeting. Uh, discussing Elon Musk's Twitter takeover. So we have a whole lot to break down there in terms of Elon's uh, uh, takeover of this, you know, of all the Twitter stuff. And uh, Joe Biden. Apparently they found, uh, Daily, Daily Mail is saying there's $5.2 million in his income unaccounted for. Makes you wonder about what he was doing with those special private deals with China and in Ukraine. So we'll talk all about this. Plus, Ron DeSantis is killing it. He's raising massive amounts of money. So we're going to talk about media, uh, um, a lot of stuff having to do with Elon Musk and uh, the billboard stuff and the aftermath of what's going on in terms of doc doxing. So should be a good time. Joining us to discuss this is Derek Harvey. Hey, glad to be here. You want to pull your mic up a little bit? Yep. Yeah, sure. Uh, tell us, who are you, good sir? Well, I'm Derek Harvey. I used to work for Devin Nunes as the lead investigator for the House Intelligence Committee. I was in the Army for 26 years and Chief of Intelligence for um, General Petraeus and General Ordierno, served almost five years in Iraq. And I was the Special Assistant and Director for Middle East Policy and North Africa Policy for President Trump in the first year of the Trump White House. Wow. So storied career. And now you are running for office uh, just right here in Maryland. Right, right here in the county you're in, Washington County. I'm running for the County Commissioner position. And I think that we need some new leadership, new change. I think I have the experience and the knowledge and the integrity to bring some changes to Washington County. This is going to be great because not only do we have to talk about stuff going on behind the scenes with the White House and uh, the Russiagate hoax and corruption in media, but uh, as, as someone who lives in and is running in Washington County, we can talk all about why the failed policies that we see in states like Maryland result in businesses fleeing, which hurt those states. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Thanks for joining us. Glad to be here. Absolutely. We have Seamus. Yeah. And I just want to say I'm really interested and exciting to hear some details about the Trump White House from an insider. I'm sure that's going to be fascinating. I'm Seamus Coughlin. I run a channel called Freedom Tunes. We upload political cartoons every single week, every Thursday. Y'all should go subscribe if you aren't already subscribed. Good to see you, Derek. I always like talking about people that have military intelligence experience. I rolled an 84. Oh, that means nice. a show. Yeah. It's a good, it'd be a great 1984 show. all over yeah. again. <laughs> oh, Jesus. 76 yesterday. Rolling, yeah. Baby. Yeah. Oh, man. You know, once, one day at a time. Uh, peace and love. And I am also here in the corner pushing buttons, as is my want. Very excited to have Derek. He has a long history, and I'm stoked to hear what he's got to say. I also want to mention there's one more story we're going to talk about. Oh, yeah? Something strange is happening with the Twitter algorithm. Thanks for reminding me, Super Chat. We have a few tweets pulled up tracking the gain in followers among right-wing personalities and the loss in followers among left-wing personalities. Some have said people are just coming back to the platform and leftists are leaving. Uh, I, I don't think that's true. I, absolutely not. Tucker Carlson didn't just gain 62,000 followers today on news that broke yesterday morning. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't make sense. Many people believe this is Twitter panicking and shutting down their manipulation of the system because Elon Musk is going to get in there and he's going to see exactly what they're doing and how much you want to bet malfeasance. And Elon Musk is going to have access to all those records. So they locked down the code. Well, they supposedly locked down the code to prevent sabotage, but could it be they locked down the code because they're doing something nefarious behind the scenes and don't want anyone to see it? 
We will see. But let's, uh, uh, before we get started, my friends, head over to TimCast.com. Become a member to help support our work. And as a member, not only do you get access to exclusive segments of the TimCast IRL podcast, Monday through Thursday at 8 p.m., you help support us in doing things like buying billboards. And uh, in this instance, with the help of the Daily Wire, they helped put this together really, really quickly. So shout out to Jeremy Boring and the Daily Wire. This is, uh, uh, this. I, I know I, I said, you know, I wanted to do this and I had a plan for it. But they had the magic and the institutional force to push back. And so I'm eternally grateful for them. But uh, this is what we're going to do. As a member, we are using your membership fees to hire journalists. We just hired, new, we hired another journalist. We're going to hire two more columnists really, really soon. We're looking to hire uh, some more hosts for new shows. We're expanding. That's thanks to you. And we're going to have fact checkers. We've got a few nonprofits we're working on. It's all about building out the culture, challenging the machine, and speaking truth to power. But let's talk about speaking truth to power. Smash that like button, subscribe to this channel, share the show with your friends. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the first story from TimCast.com. TimCast CEO puts billboard in Times Square calling out Washington Post reporters doxing of libs of TikTok. Taylor Lorenz blocked Tim Pool on Twitter after videos of the sign were posted online. Oh, I want to talk about this so bad. Now we do have a disclaimer. At the top, it says Tim Pool is the owner yeah. and CEO of TimCast <laughs> Media, including TimCast.com, because we have standards. Yeah, this seems a little biased. I'm going to be honest. Actually, it's not. It's a straightforward news story. I don't and know. The fact I got to look into it. I'm not going to take your word for it. I have you, I have TimCast, CEO of TimCast, telling me his article on TimCast about him, the CEO of TimCast, isn't biased. That's Do you right. expect it me is, to buy that right now? It is not biased. All right. Well, you I'll see, the fact that we reveal that information shows <laughs> it's actually particularly straightforward. It's just several quotes. So uh, a new message has joined the glowing advertisements in New York City's Times Square, admonishing the Washington Post for publishing private information of the creator of Libs of TikTok Twitter account. It shows statements from me. It, sh- it shows that, you know, very straightforward. Jeremy Boring and, and, and Tim Cass put this together. Taylor Lorenz, the technology reporter for The Washington Post. It shows, uh, uh, I believe, uh, just statements from me mostly about it. Now, I suppose you can argue that Taylor, uh, her responses should have been included in the story. But considering it's just about the billboard and why I did it, I think that's fair. And I think it's fair when I say, you know, this is how we're addressing it. What is it? Incredibly cool and handsome CEO yes. of Tim Cast. Publishes awesome billboard. This also says it also it. says super strong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. really yeah. strong. Yeah. And, 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 and his, I won't take that from and, you. And his mom says he's the most handsome. Uh, that's yeah. true. Okay, I don't that's know. Fair. I think the way this should have been framed is bigoted far right figure harasses a poor innocent journalist. That's more like it. So let's let, let's <laughs> let, let me tell you guys real quick just about what happened. So we talked about putting up the billboard. We were like fingers crossed they'll approve it. They did. All right. I think I, I will play for you the video right here. It's actually quite simple. It says, democracy dies in darkness. Turn that down. That's why we're shining a light on you. Taylor Lorenz doxed at libs of TikTok. At TimCast. So first, let me just address uh, some of the, the immediate points people brought up. Why didn't we link to anything? Why didn't we use it as an opportunity to promote the show? You can't. Yeah, you can't. You cannot use other people's likenesses to advertise your product. So there are rules, restrictions, and laws. Also, I'm like, I have to sign it. I'm the one who did it. I'm not going to pretend it wasn't me. We're going to put TimCast on it. What else are we going to do? I figured if we didn't, it would be, I don't know. I should, I should, I should have my name on the things that I'm doing. So that's, that's ultimately how we decided to do it. The first thing that happens after we put it up is Taylor Lorenz responded saying, Tim Pool, actually, I think we might have the, the, the tweets from Taylor Lorenz as to what she, what she said. Maybe not. Okay, hold on. No, I don't think we do. But uh, uh, Taylor Lorenz responded that Tim Pool and the CEO of the Daily Wire put up this billboard trying to discredit my journalism. My response was that I, I didn't uh, uh, want to discredit her journalism. Actually, I defended her reporting on libs of TikTok. However, she lied about doxing, and that's what needed to be called out. Her response was, or so, so let, me, let me show you this image. I said to her, uh, when her response was like, you know, a goofy face saying, oh, the Internet's so crazy. I said, I'm glad you and your friends are happy. You made your point on CNN. I made mine on Times Square. And now we can move on. She responded, my family and friends are not happy. They have been subject to a nonstop stream of hateful attacks, doxing and violent attacks driven by this baseless campaign. Happy to hear you're moving on. Taylor, I did not insult you. I did not dox you. And I defended your reporting. I called you a liar because you lied about doxing libs of TikTok. If you do not want to be held to account 
for, for amoral or unethical activities, you should not be in media committing amoral or unethical activities. I do not tolerate insulting the person over, the, over her appearance or age. I do not support doxing. And I think libs of TikTok should be reported on. We need to know who the influential people behind our politics are. But when you lie about it, you get called out. Now she's claiming that there's violent attacks and it's, I'm part of this campaign. Oh, you know what? Just just spare me. Words are violence. Remember that. Words are violence. And that's where we're at. Yep. No, I mean, look, it's no secret. This podcast has been swatted a number of times. People here have been threatened. I also have had people harass me, do things that have made me feel unsafe. I have been doxxed. I don't like saying it. I don't like talking about it. It's a little bit weird to bring it up every single time someone criticizes you. Yeah, it's funny because she's like, this is violence against me. And then she posts it. Huh. So I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think you're being serious. You know, you know, I think when the story first comes out, I tweeted the link. She tweets it with a goofy face saying, oh, these people are so crazy. Oh, this post is so dumb. But then when I said, glad you're not upset and we can move on, she lost it. She blocked me immediately. Then she, started, then she made another tweet saying, this is the violence behind this. And now she's acting like it's the big attack against her. No, I think she likes the press. What's the evidence of violence? I'd like to her to explain that to everybody. Well, see, we've talked about this before. It's, 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 it's a fascinating thesis. Mm. See, um, if you grow up uh, or, or uh, grow up in, in hardship, or uh, perhaps you're in the armed forces, you experience real risks and real threats. When you are at risk of losing your life from the job you're working, you know what violence really is. When you've been punched, attacked, or assaulted, you know what violence really is. But if you are a soft-bellied, I don't know, let's say your family's rich and they sent you to like a Swiss boarding school, and so you've never really experienced hardship— well, no one's ever dared speak ill of you. So the first time someone says a nasty word, you get that shock to your system like someone attacked you. They feel physical pain like, oh, you, you said what about me? That's never happened before. She and probably that, grew up with participation awards and being told she was great the whole time. Yeah, she went to a Swiss boarding school. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I can't imagine someone like her has actually experienced hardship. But I think I, I don't think she's um, I don't think she's stupid. Certainly, she understands that she doxed libs of TikTok and is lying about it because it's seriously easily proven. It's now been confirmed by multiple sources. We, that, that's why I pulled up other sources. We have this from the Washington Free Beacon, which is my friend's NewsGuard certified, which says Lorenz not only revealed the identity of the anonymous person who runs the account, but also included a copy of the person's real estate license, which showed her home address. The Post later removed the home address from the story, then lied about it, saying we did not publish or link to any details about her personal life. Let me just show you Taylor Lorenz's Wikipedia, which says the article further publicized the identity of the account owner as Chaya Reichik and provided personal details. OK, so she's lying. It's obvious she's lying and she knows she's lying. Tim, what's her motivation for doing that? Because by exposing that por those personal details, it's inviting harassment minimally. It's inviting violence. You're calling her out and you're giving them the directions to where to go get her. Yeah, I think, look, I'm not going to give Taylor the benefit of the doubt. I think they, uh, she or whoever on the team included the link to the private address, knowing what they were doing to terrorize. Because, you know, we, we've got security issues. We know exactly what it means. And we have, we have armed guards now. We have to get armed security in a variety of fashions. So when someone publishes your address in one of the most powerful and largest institutional publications in the world, even if it's for only an hour or two, you know what that means. It means you're not safe. And because of that, the person behind Libs of TikTok had to flee to a safe location. Now, it's possible that this is no longer the current address of the individual. All I know, and as we've reported, is that the address is listed in public records as the private residence of the individual. Sometimes people have addresses listed in the public and they move from them and never change it. I think it's a fair point to make because I want to make sure everyone's getting as much understanding of what's going on as possible. Taylor Lorenz has not provided any evidence or any counterclaim other than didn't do it. It's like, okay, well, well, here's the link. It's in the archive. No, didn't do it. The Washington Post says they didn't even link to it. Well, not but you can actually just see the link in the article in the archive. Yeah. And not only I didn't do it, but you are victimizing me by pointing out the fact that I did it. Correct. Very slimy. I, I don't want to give them the benefit of the doubt for putting that up, but I don't want to assume intent. 
either. So I don't know exactly why it all happened. But here's the thing. So, Ian, even if they didn't realize that this person was going to be harassed and potentially threatened and have their safety put at risk when they publish their address, that would just make them incredibly incompetent journalists who aren't worthy of their platform. That's so either sure. way, it's horrible. Hey, I agree with that. Yeah, Massive failure regardless. It has to be called out. Yeah, I'm kind of like, geez, go easy on this. But no, don't, because they really made a, a journalistic um, faux pas or like, like massive mistake in, in rendering, you know, as little harm as possible to the people that you're reporting on. And that needs to be called out so it doesn't happen again. Well, they always cry foul when it's done to them. Mm -hmm. When they're called out, when they're named, you know, they're a victim right away. And they did it to somebody else and they're denying it. And they always deny and then they move on and they don't want to be held accountable. What's, the, what's that uh, Darvo? Is that what it's called? I don't know, I've heard of Durvo or something. There's this thing they that the left always says. It's like deny, uh, attack, reverse attack, victim and yeah. offender. Yes. Oh, so you reverse the victim and the offender. You deny that's what it, she's doing. You attack and then you reverse the victim and the defender. And that's right. what Taylor Lorenz is doing. Absolutely. She's offender denying rather. she did the doxing. She's attacking people who 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 are calling her out, and she's making herself the victim and the people who she attacked the the you know the offenders. So it's funny because it's the left that often tweets about that, saying the right does it, but literally this is what they do. Oh no, I'm being. It's like that that cartoon you ever see of the woman, the feminist, and she's shoveling crap over yeah. a wall and says opinions <laughs> over the internet. And when yep. they throw it back, she goes, "Help! I'm being oppressed." <laughs> it's like welcome, welcome to the real world. Listen, you do not get to wield institutional power as a weapon and then hide behind it, because now these people are starting to realize what happens when other people who also have the ability to wield institutional power, decide to strike back. And they're not going to like it. But I am done sitting around. All we did, all we did, is put up a simple message. Taylor Lorenz doxed libs of TikTok. Mm -hmm. I did not insult her. I did not post her address. I didn't reveal any private information about her. I made a simple statement. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, well, part of what makes this so hideous is the fact that a few weeks ago, before this was even a story, <laughs> Taylor Lorenz was on MSNBC, and she started crying because she said she fears for what people will do with each tiny little bit of information about her that was leaked. So she's clearly very conscious about this kind of thing. And then she went on to publish somebody else's personal, private address. And then lie about it. And then lie about it. All right. Well, speaking of, uh, of crying... Let's 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 advance to uh, the next story in this saga, which is it's it's all it's all somewhat related, but this is, it's a little bit different. We have this from Politico. Twitter's top lawyer reassures staff and cries during meeting about Musk takeover. Vijaya Gade, a key executive involved in decisions to remove former President Donald Trump and ban political advertising, expressed uncertainty about the future of the platform. I'll, I'm not going to gloat over someone crying. Um, I think it's a good example, nonetheless of the problems this company has. Elon Musk did not do anything. The deal's not even done. All that's happened is they've they've signed the document saying we're going to we're going to have a deal. For all we know, doesn't go through for some reason. Side note, in the event the deal doesn't go through, Twitter has to pay Elon Musk 1 billion dollars. Okay. If Elon Musk screws up the deal, he's got to pay them 1 billion dollars. But I doubt that's going to happen. So if the shareholders vote no on this deal, they have Elon cornered these 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 this, this company. This is incredible. Let me just break this down. Elon makes the offer shortly before their first quarter earnings report, in which the revenue is likely going to show bad bad quarter, so the stock will go down. Elon Musk offers them a premium. If they reject that and the stock goes down, now they're liable to the shareholders for not accepting something they they knew was a, was a good deal. In the deal. They agree to a one million a one billion dollar breakup clause. If the shareholders vote no, Elon Musk gets a free billion dollars. So now the shareholders are like, if we don't vote for this, not only are we likely going to see the stock plummet, but we're going to be out. The, the company will be out a billion dollars, causing it to plummet even more. Elon won. Then 4D chess. If their stock plummets, he just gets a bunch of Robinhood accounts, buys it up anyway. Boom. Elon wins. He gets he gets all of their toilet paper shares. <laughs> but so for those of you may be familiar, Vijaya Gade is the woman who was on the Joe Rogan experience with me and Jack Dorsey. And she's breaking down and crying. Many people pointed out the reason she was on that show is she's actually the person behind everything that's been happening at Twitter in terms of all the wokeness, the political manipulation. It's her. She's the one. And now she's crying over this. 
Look, I'm not here to gloat over the crying. You want to make fun of her for crying and laugh about it? Fine. I'll just point out the crying shows they've know, they, they know they've lost. This is a major moment. Mm -hmm. Oh, it reminds me of when the Google employees had the their big open house or the the big meeting after Trump won, and they were all crying and and worried and it the the tremendous angst that they expressed about their role in allowing Trump to win and defeat Hillary Clinton, and we saw them respond and react. What I'm wondering about is what's going to happen in the Twitter world at the business because there's going to be a resistance there, I think, to what Elon Musk wants to do. The culture is so ingrained with the wokeness there from the bottom and the top. And we saw it with, this, with the attorney crying here. How do you say her name again? Vijaya Gade. I can't try that one. That's too hard for me. But um, it's an example of what he's going to face with the personnel there and the wokeness. And he's going to face a resistance like President Trump faced with the administrative state. Well, then yes, the first thing you yes. do is fire Vijaya. And then everyone else is going well, to Well, that's bow. what Trump should have done with a lot of people in the first place. Mm. He should have terminated some of these people. And he but, loves saying you're fired. It's shocking that he didn't. But there's civil, there's civil protections on many of the government employees, right? Mm. On some of them, but there were a lot of them. And the national security staff, we should have let a lot of people go right away. We had a lot of political appointees that were allowed to hang on. Elon Elon Musk can walk in and say you're fired. Yes, he, he can. He owns it outright. It's remarkable seeing some of these people, they really don't understand anything about work or companies. Because some of these lefties are like, Elon Musk is, you know, I'm losing a bunch of followers. Elon Musk is causing a lot of damage to the shareholders. And it's just like, you realize he bought the company 100%. There's no shareholders anymore. It's just him. And he's I, happy with I it. I hope people understand that if you're crying about the new boss that's coming in, he's going to fire you if he finds that <laughs> out. No, yeah, that's exactly. I was just thinking that it's remarkable how dumb and even really unemployable these people are outside of any kind of environment where they're being catered to by their higher ups. The fact that somebody takes over to the company that you're working for and you immediately start publicly trash talking them is so ridiculous. Well, it's like they've never had another job in their lives. Well, what their attitude should be, and I, I grew up in the military and I, I matured through learning how to be a team player and a leader and work for people and we have changes of command and we have changes of administrations that we had to respond to over the years. What your job is, is to find out where the boss wants to go, help him get there, okay? If there are problems in his way, identify what those problems are and help mitigate those, give him a pathway. You're supposed to be part of a team. And if you're not gonna row the oars in the direction that the new boss wants to go, you have an obligation to resign. Well, he, Seamus, this probably is their first job. Yeah, that's what I'm a, saying. A lot of these people probably got masters or something, got out of college at 24 and then applied at Twitter and it's the first place they've ever worked. Mm -hmm. They probably view Twitter as a home. Yeah, not a job. something like that. Well, and I've sort of joked about this in the past, but it's part of why we live in such a bizarre world where conservative people are afraid to voice their own opinions and signal the fact that they're on the right and left-wing people are very comfortable doing so at their jobs. Because when you state you're a left-wing individual of this brand of progressivism, all you're doing is advertising the fact that you're unemployable. And yet it seems yeah. as if employers yeah. are fine with it. Like, what are you going to do if you get rid of all the conservatives? Fire everyone who shows up on time? And Fire I, everyone who cares about doing the job? Fire everyone who doesn't have an entitlement complex? I'm pretty sure political protections, p political discrimination only exists in Washington, D.C. for the most part. I mean, maybe there are some jurisdi smaller jurisdictions, but uh, D.C. protects political affiliation as a protected class. Makes sense. If you're forced to go live in D.C., at least partially because you're in Congress or whatever, having someone say we don't serve Republicans is a huge problem. Outside of there, I'm pretty sure you, if you went to a company and said that you were a leftist, they could be like, we're not hiring you. Mm -hmm. Or if you were in the middle of your job and said you were a leftist or a conservative, they could be like, you're fired for mm -hmm. that reason. Yeah, well, it's an interesting point, too, because you could have a, a particular business that has to service a market. So, for example, if you were doing something like producing conservative content, you probably wouldn't want to hire left wing people. And it would be bizarre if there was a law requiring you to do so. I don't think that hiring anybody that's political makes sense. If someone comes in and they're like, I identify, they're like, get out, identi identity <laughs> politics person. Well, hold on there. Gender identity is protected. That's that's it's pretty insane, in my opinion, sometimes. Weird thing to bring up in a job interview. That you can interview. decide yeah. what your gender is and then have that protected is insane. I understand immutable characteristics that you didn't choose, but if it's gender that you get to pick, that's weird. And in New York, Agreed. gender identity is, is described in law as self-expression. Yeah, that's which self-expression is not. That that's defies corporate logic. We've, we've talked about this. It's... Uh, 
there is no black and white approach to upholding civil rights. It's always a gradient because everything is connected to everything else. There's this idea that exists among many traditional or classical liberals where it's like, if we enshrine in law that men and women shall be treated equally, we are done. We've done it. We have equal rights. And then someone says, okay, they're treated equally. What does that mean? Well, it means you can't discriminate against them based on you know their biological sex. It's like, okay, well, this bathroom says women only. You mean I'm not allowed to go in it because I'm biologically male? Well, that's discriminating, isn't it? it? It literally is in law. In which case, then you have judges trying to say, okay, well, there's an, exep- an exemption in that one. Like, we, we didn't mean that. You didn't? What happens is a generation goes by and people don't know what you actually meant. All that matters is what's written down in law. And you get textualists who then just say, and eh, it says you can't do it. That's where we're at now. The 1964 Civil Rights Act meant some very obvious things. Provide service to people. Don't kick them out because of these characteristics. Now it's it's being challenged across the board. So what ends up happening is you had that, uh, I think it was a Supreme Court case where they tried arguing that, I think this is what happened, right? Gender identity was considered the same thing as sexuality in some court case. Yes, that's correct. And they're not, but the court said so. And so I, I think that's what brought us to where we are now. One thing led to another because everything is interconnected. It's not a slippery slope. It's just dominoes falling over. The next thing that's going to happen is in New York where they say gender identity is just self-expression, well, they have to do that because what are they really protecting when they protect gender identity? If you are biologically male and want to wear a dress and call yourself Susan, that's what they're protecting. But what's the difference between calling yourself Susan in a dress and calling yourself Volciferon, Herald of the Winter Mists, while wearing a fursuit? Literally nothing, except for the cultural interpretation. But if a judge can say one set of clothing is protected and another isn't, based on his personal interpretation, then you're going to you're going to get a whole bunch of challenges. Now judges are supposed to interpret the law, but the next step will be in 20 years they're going to say the law says my self-expression. That means I want to go to work as Volciferon. You think it's going to take a whole 20 years for that? No, no, no. no. I think a couple Not years. Not at all. Yeah. yeah. But um, but actually, I think it might be reversing. I mean, look at what's going on with Twitter. These people are crying. They, they've lost this this mission that they've been on. Well, I'm not sure they've lost yet. No, I mean, uh, I mean this this portion of it. it they're well, losing. There's good news, okay, and I, I think we have good reason to be hopeful for what Twitter could become, and it was really quite bad, okay, and it wasn't doing that well as a business, was it? Five billion dollars in revenues. It wasn't profitable. 113 million active followers. Well, they, they, I think they got up to 212 million. At one time. Yeah. At one time. But the latest, according to Epoch Times, is 113 million. If that's true, their stock was about to plummet. Right. And so. To 10 bucks. The, the people that work for Twitter should look at Elon Musk as a savior because the business model was not working the way these guys had been running it. I just did some math at 7,500 plus employees imagining that they're making $75,000 a year. They're probably making more than that. It's more than half a billion dollars a year and in, in just in employee salaries. Like That's way, way, way too much for a company that's only pulling in $5 billion. I mean, I guess a fifth of your, op, a fifth of your revenue is, is I, don't, I haven't worked at enough companies to know if that's, that just sounds like way too much uh, expenditure on employees. And for a company that can send its people remote, it doesn't make I want I to look at the business plan. I want to just say, uh, when we're talking about jobs, I think Vijaya Gade's job is not long for this world. Uh, uh, Sagar and Jetty says, Vijaya Gade, the top censorship advocate at Twitter, who famously gaslit the world on Joe Rogan's podcast and censored the Hunter Biden laptop story, is very upset about the Elon Musk takeover. Elon Musk responded, suspending the Twitter account of a major news organization for publishing a truthful story was obviously incredibly inappropriate. Absolutely. I can't imagine Elon Musk as the owner of this company is going to go in there and be like, I'm going to keep this person. In fact, he's probably going to go in there and say, you caused the, the bulk of the problem. So thank you for your time and you're free to go. So, Derek, I'm curious, as someone who has worked in the, the White House and some pretty high levels within government, how is social media viewed or discussed at that level, if at all? Well, that's a good question. It is discussed a lot. And how to navigate it if you're in the Trump White House the stories, the media, and the way big media, mainstream media integrated itself with the narratives of 
social media. And we see today that, you know, CNN was actively coordinating with, you know, people that were behind the Russia hoax to get the narrative right and to expand on it. You know, we worried about it a lot. Most of us were looking at the social media impact as a, as a national level of influence for overseas, because I dealt mostly in the foreign policy world, and what we could learn from social media, from looking at social media accounts in Ukraine or the Middle East or what ISIS was posting. So there's different ways of looking at it. Um, from my perspective, it was as an intelligence tool to get insights into, into groups, organizations, and people. Do you think this is part of why the Taliban was allowed to be on Twitter while Trump was banned? Well. You look at, at Khomeini and leaders of the Codes Force being on Twitter mm -hmm. and the measures that they were taking and what they were calling for, violence against Israel, violence against other people, calling out for the death of President Trump. Um, and they were not shut down. Mm -hmm. They were not banned. So the hypocrisy of the leadership of Twitter and when they talk about values yeah. and threats of violence, they never followed up their words with actions in exercising their leadership in an unbiased way. Mm. They never did, and that's part of the reason they've had so many problems, and they lost so many followers, from 214 million to 113 active users. Let's talk about some weird going on. Weird, weird goings on. We have this tweet from Tyler Carditis. Tyler is the CEO of Blaze Media, and he says, definitely something bizarre happening with the Twitter algorithm impacting follower counts over the past 24 to 48 hours. A few examples. Tucker Carlson is up 62,000. Rogan, 63. Trump Jr., 87. And Ted Cruz is up 51,000. However, by contrast, Rachel Maddow is down 18. Anderson Cooper is down 10. AOC is down 27. Kamala Harris, 22. Hillary Clinton, 17. What's going on? He goes in a mention. Tulsi Gabbard is up. Rand Paul is up. Ilhan Omar is down. Here was my response. So Tucker gained 62,000 followers in half a day. He lost 50 followers yesterday. This is not people coming back. News broke yesterday. Something effed up is happening. Now, a lot of people responded saying, my account was inactive or I just started a new account. If you did not log into your account and then you log in, that's not making a new account. Like that's not making a new account. You're not all of a sudden now following me for the first time. If you were already following me, you just didn't use your account. It existed. I had the follower. Correct. This is new followers on his account. Tell me this. When the news broke yesterday morning that Elon Musk had was set to finish this deal with Twitter, why then didn't people sign up? Maybe they said, no, no, I will only sign up once I hear the news. Okay. Why didn't they sign up at 2.53 p.m. when the news broke that Elon had secured the deal? Why did they wait until the very next day to start signing up. He, Tucker Carlson lost 50 followers yesterday. He gained 62,000 today. Something does not make sense. You guys put it in my mind that there's some nefarious stuff going on behind the scenes where they're like, oh, better undo that blacklist algorithm that we had going in secret so that no one finds out. And now it's just, this is the recalibration. I mean, it's total speculation. I have no idea what's happening right now. Well, I think it's, we have to speculate. And I think the issue is I, we're not going to be able to understand what's going on until there's someone inside. The Elon Musk team gets in there and asks the questions, and hopefully the records are preserved, the algorithms and what they're doing are preserved, and one can go back and look at, was there shadow banning? How many bots were there? How many of the, the bots, how many bots were following, you know, uh, a congress lady or a senator? Yeah, it's real tempting as a social media network to count the bots as people that are logging in every day. Of those one point, how many did you say millions of people log in a day? 10 million, what was 113 it? 113 million. How many of those are bots? Twitter's not going to go out of its way to hunt them down and eradicate them. They're going to let those numbers stand for so that they can get a better investment. Interesting. I want to I make, uh, I want to highlight a few posts, though. There, there's a possibility this is something in, in, not nefarious. It's interesting. One person said, no, people are just reactivating their accounts because they want to neener over the meltdowns. Good point. It may actually be that many people deactivated their Twitters and have all reacted, reactivated them right now because, you know, they want to yeah. be on Twitter. But hold on. Someone else said, speaking for myself, I am back for the first time since 2018. 
my phone number was banned from creating an account until yesterday. Huh. So somebody uh. tweeted saying that they were banned until yesterday. Here's another one. Matt, Matt FTM says, I was finally just allowed to tweet and use the platform two days ago after being permabanned for four years. I assume I'm not the only one who was sidelined for having too few followers to make noise. Starting over fresh now, though, and not going anywhere. Several posts. I've seen this. I, I, re, I retweeted someone. A lot of people all of a sudden are saying, I was banned and now I'm allowed back on the platform. So yes, it seems like maybe there's a mix. But here's why I don't think it's just conservatives coming back and reactivating their accounts. It means simultaneously and by perfect, perfect physics, the left is deactivating as the right reactivates. I have seen evidence of that. Uh, I went on Facebook for all my friends from LA who are actors out there, and man, they are deleting their Twitters. They are all up in arms about it. I've deleted my Twitter yesterday. I'm done with Twitter. They are. No more then Twitter maybe? for me. So they're actually deleting it. They're mm -hmm. not just saying they're going to. Well, what happens counts. if you delete it from your iPhone? Well, if you delete the app, you still have the account. If you s delete your account, that's a different story. That probably mm -hmm. removes the follower number. Yeah, I don't I'm wonder, know. Though. I'm wondering how many are actually removing their account. They might not want to be active, but they want to sort of follow. I don't and Sean think... King, he de de deleted his account, but then reinstantiated it, it, deactivated it, and, and then, then reactivated it. it later. All the media reported he deactivated. He was off the platform. And then he came back like, no, I didn't. I didn't do that. What? He did. So okay. so maybe maybe it really is that simple. Mm -hmm. That the people on the left are like harumphi saying they're leaving, but <laughs> Elon Musk didn't do anything. But they He doesn't even own the platform yet. They say they're going to Canada, but they never go to Canada. Yeah. yeah. Right. They'll be back. I wonder back. if we could find out how many of these followers, like Rachel Maddow, Hillary Clinton, it was the same person following all those five accounts, and they, they that one person left, so it looks like five followers were lost. Well, that, that's why it's not relevant. Um, I'm not adding up all the numbers. Yeah. I'm doing them individually, like Tucker gained 62,000. You think 62,000? So, look, I don't buy it. You mean to tell me that yesterday, when the news broke that Elon did this, 50 people were like, I'm quitting and deactivating my account. I, I know, wonder if maybe. he was shadow banned and those people have been trying to follow him, but it never was reflected in the numbers. Here's one possibility. People on the left follow Tucker Carlson. And so 3,000 leftists quit and 2,950 or uh, conservatives joined. So it's a negative 50 number. Maybe. I don't think the left follows Tucker Carlson because we know this from Vijay Agade. Leftists don't follow conservative journalists. Conservatives do follow left-wing journalists. So it seems... Unlikely. I look at this. Yesterday, conservatives were deactivating their accounts. They don't buy it. Mm -mm. You yeah. know, I, I think people are mentioning they were unbanned for the first time. I think Elon Musk is going to walk in the doors and there's going to be something within the system of Twitter that is so obvious and overtly political bias. They got rid of it. They said, get, get, get rid of it. The new guy's coming in. And if he sees that, we're in trouble. And imagine what the press is going to be. Preserve the evidence. Well, they got they have until October to finish the deal. Yeah, I know. And it's going to so, be very yeah. hard. So I'm definitely very interested to see what it is. At the very least, this is exposed. What we are already knew and we all already said, and which has been exposed a million times before, but basically that these people are weak and they're cowardly. You know, Twitter was actively censoring conservatives and conservatives were still staying. It's not even as if Elon has come and said, we're going to instantiate a policy of censoring left-wing people. They've just said they're going to stop censoring conservatives. Yeah. And they're like, I can't be here for that. That's the amazing thing people pointed out, that Elon Musk is not saying he's going to wield power against Democrats. He's simply saying Twitter will stop putting the boot on conservatives. And so they're all freaking out. But, but liberals, like you said, do not want to read or listen to alternative points of view, even if they're evidence-based. Yeah. Conservatives tend to look at a wider cross-section of information. They get blamed all the time for, oh, you only get your news from Fox News. That's the farthest thing from the case because most everyone I know, and I think you know too, and the evidence bears it out even by Twitter's own, own people, conservatives tend to look at other sources of information that are not con confirmation bias based. Yeah, I mean, there have been studies about this that we've talked about before on the show that conservatives are more likely to understand left-wing positions than left-wingers are to understand conservative positions. But I think it even goes deeper than that. As a very wise left-wing liberal arts major told me when I was in college, when you're used to a position of privilege, equality feels like oppression. Well, 
that's what's happening to them on Twitter. <laughs> They're finally getting a taste of some small iota of potential equality somewhere down the line, and they are losing their minds. So I'm just trying to we got we got we've got breaking news <clears throat> coming in, but um, man, I'm, we got we got a, a ton we got we got too much going on. That was too brilliant. Much, too much tell me about it. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, so sorry, we, we, I was I was checking uh, important. He was just saying all, a bunch of awesome stuff. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you! Oh, oh my yeah, gosh, this yeah. is my best episode. <laughs> <laughs> let's just keep. Let's stay on this fire. topic. <laughs> <laughs> all right, continue. Well, no, I mean, I'm all. I, I was hoping you wouldn't call me out like that. Like I'm out of insights. That's <laughs> it for the night. One of the things, one of the things well, no. you were saying is oh, sure. about um, conservatism, looking outside the box, kind of taking in about. I think that the scientific method is actually a very conservative function. Um, and, and it's kind of the basis of modern science. There's other types of science that aren't the scientific method. I don't even know if I come up with one off the top of my head. But to say, like, it feels like it should be this way, so let's just assume it's going to be like that. That seems like what you would say is the liberal mind right now, unfortunately. Um, being a little extreme, taking risks, unnecessary risks, violates the entire scientific method where you just try and disprove yourself and have humility. Well, I, it just reminds me of something Secretary Rumsfeld said about the known knowns, the known unknowns, and then the unknown unknowns, mm. Mm. okay? And conservatives tend to be, in my view, more exploratory. Yeah, I think mm. uh, yeah. liberals are driven by emotion. Well, and we've talked about this. You use this phrase a lot. The left sees that or believes that there is no truth but power. And so it doesn't matter what the actual scientific consensus is on something. It doesn't matter what the evidence says or what makes sense. What matters is what will get me more power, what will get me more and, and if something comes up, like in climate science, that challenges their dogma, they attack it. Mm -hmm. They don't want to understand it. They don't look at the evidence and try to parse it out. They want to attack it, deny it, and go after the person and discredit them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And even there, whenever they have a statistic that sounds like it would support their case, they completely distort it. So when they say things like 97% of climate scientists agree that humans are responsible in some way for climate change, what they're leaving out is 97% of climate scientists did not say we need a Green New Deal or that the world is going to end in 10 years or that it's catastrophic. But that's all assumed when they say 97% of climate scientists agree with our narrative. But it's not so, the case. So Twitter banned ads that go against their narrative on climate change. That's overtly political. Mm -hmm. The ads themselves aren't gruesome or offensive or objectionable. They're just politically objectionable if you have the wrong opinion. This company was overtly biased. The left just lies and pretends it's not. And they manipulate people and it works. So when I talk to people like uh, Stephen Marsh, for instance, who he was a good dude, came on the show. He's like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm just looking at things from above. I'm not on either side. But his worldview is influenced by manipulation and deception coming from the left. And he doesn't even know about things like Joe and Hunter Biden sharing a bank account. It's like, well, you're not in the middle, dude. You're on the left. You're not doing the research. And he's like, I, I did the research. I'm like, yeah, I get it. You're doing research on like polls and studies. But you didn't know that that Joe Biden and Hunter Biden shared a bank account. Now, when I say that, they call me right wing for saying it when it's a fact, not an opinion. But uh, let's let's jump over to this. We got breaking news. So I was actually this this is why I got distracted because I had I got a notification on my phone. We have this from the Hodge twins. It's actually a Veritas video breaking leaked audio of Twitter. All hands reveals employees press leadership over what free speech means. A plan for mass exodus due to Elon Musk's questionable ethics and questioning if President Trump will return to the platform. Shout out to James O'Keefe and Project Veritas. Elon Musk, you need to reinstate them immediately as soon as you gain control of the company. Let's play this uh, this video and see what's going on. Mr. Musk, plan on dealing with a mass exodus, considering the acquisition is by a person with questionable ethics. The question of attrition, um, you know, as Parag stated, you know, uh, one of the themes of today is continuity um, and ensuring that Parag and this leadership team continues to operate the business successfully on behalf of our users, on behalf of our customers. Um, and that has obviously been a big topic of discussion at the board. And as I mentioned, an area that uh, is important to Elon Musk as well, because of the importance of Twitter as a service. With no board in place, who will keep Elon accountable and how? Elon made it clear in public that a large part of the reason he bought the platform was because of our moderation policies and disagreements in how we deal with health. This puts Twitter service and trust and safety, as well as anybody who cares about health on the platform, in a very difficult position. Twitter service, the role of our policies, and the capabilities we've built around content moderation are fundamental to keeping Twitter safe and growing. 
I believe that there is a lot of work we have to do to continue making that better. I want to pause real quick in the middle of this. We got another minute, but I just want to point out conservatives are willing to stay on the platform when they're getting censored and the left is getting away with it. Yeah. The left is unwilling to stay on the platform if conservatives aren't getting censored. So Twitter saw the formula. You can ban a conservative and most conservatives stay. You ban a liberal, they freak out and revolt. Only ban the conservatives. This is evidenced by the fact that by sheer fear that Elon might bring Trump back, they're leaving the platform. I say it this way. When you had the weak parent in charge of Twitter and the little kid was screaming, I want an ice cream cone or I'll hold my breath. Twitter's Parag Agrawal and Vijaya Gade were like, okay, okay, just stop screaming and I'll give you the ice cream. Elon Musk is the dad being like, okay, go hold your breath outside and I'll have the ice cream inside. You don't, you're not getting ice cream. But let's, uh, let's play and more. And now they're going, I'm running away from home. And he's like, good, bye. Yeah. Here we go. Sometimes that means more thoughtful moderation. Sometimes that means making things simpler. Sometimes that means changing product incentives to be able to solve problems through products sometimes instead of policies. During the last of all hands, you said that you trust Elon Musk. The correct quote was, we trust him. So who is we and talking to Elon, what made you trust him? And based on the conversation I had with him uh, when we were excited to have him join our board, that was because as a major shareholder and an opinionated user, we wanted that voice in our boardroom so that we could learn is there an updated understanding on what free speech means? The question behind the question here, which is where might Twitter's product go as a private company in the future once this deal closes? To best gain perspective on this, as I said earlier, we'll find ways to bring Elon for a Q&A with all of you to understand better what his vision for the future of Twitter might look like. I wouldn't say anything outright or overtly crazy other than these people are blind, completely clueless, and they're right. Elon joining the board was an opinionated outside perspective that would help them, but they, they, they blocked him. So him coming in and just saying, I'm taking it over, good, shake it up a little bit. They have ideological blinders. They talk about moderation policies. They don't have moderation policies. They have extremist policies that are driven by censorship of views that they don't like. They talk about safety, but almost all their their rules on safety dealing with the COVID outbreak turned out the science wasn't on their side over time. Drugs that they said didn't work actually worked. The CDC was wrong on masks. The CDC was wrong on the, the effects of the uh, immunizations on people. We have to be a little specific, though. I, I think the, the issue is that Twitter decided one doctor was better than another doctor Correct. when they shouldn't ha they shouldn't be doing that. YouTube takes a similar position in that they YouTube's decided the same doctors that Twitter sided with are the correct doctors. And this is the problem. YouTube, you are not correct. However, I will say on the mask thing, in, in what context do you, were, were you referring to the CDC mask things? Mask, they were first saying mask aren't needed right and then they don't work and then they said they're needed and then we found out that the masks were not effective against the size of the the virus but it, but it and, is a and then it, it evolved up and down over time okay so it was it was just strange and it lost a lot of confidence of people in the cdc on on that I, issue i think the most important point is that early on twitter was on the side of don't discuss lab leak theory mm -hmm. And they were also on the side of when Dr. Fauci came out in March of 2020 saying, don't wear masks, Twitter was on, on his side. And he was wrong about that. He came back out later and says, OK, maybe you should wear masks. And Twitter just flips with him. I'm right. like, you cannot build confidence with people if you can't give them a cohesive set of instructions on what the plan is. They would just come out and say, oh, well, the science changed. OK, well, my, I think the, I, I don't know where we're at with the pandemic. You, YouTube has goofy rules. I think uh, it's fair to say in addressing those goofy rules, masks stop you from spitting on people. So they have oh, a, cer yeah. a certain degree of effect, uh, effectiveness. Okay, so, so the sanitation issue, it turns out that getting it from touching something, okay, you have a one in 10,000 chance of it being transmissible, okay, if you touch a contaminated surface. But we were first told that if you touch a surface, you have a high chance of getting it. And everyone was 
cleansing everything. People were cleaning the canned goods coming back from the grocery store based upon CDC guidance. It turned out that was wrong. It created hysteria. Subway cars were being sanitized every day, multiple times, but it wasn't necessary. Yeah, this is uh, from this conversation, the obsession with health and the obsession with safety is really disturbing. It sounds like rhetoric, and maybe this isn't the conversation to have, the ethical conversation, but compared to the board meetings we would have at Minds and the conversations, this is complete insane rhetoric where you're like, yo, if you're going to spin this word around the house like this, you better def let's talk about what it means. Well, Amen. Let's come back to one point she said on there. Free speech. What does free speech mean? Free speech means free speech except yelling fire in a movie theater, right? You're allowed to do that. You're allowed to do that. You're allowed to yell fire in a movie theater. If it's empty. No. No, you're allowed. Oh, you can, but you can be if punished there's fire. for fire. No, you can't. Oh. So this was actually reversed, I think, in like 1968. So it's Brandenburg v. Ohio, I think. Okay. The, uh, the initial ruling in the early 1900s was that, well, you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. And the Supreme Court overruled that saying, yeah, you can. You, you actually can do that. Can you go into a restaurant and be like, there's rats all over the place, and then everyone <laughs> runs out of the restaurant and doesn't that, come back? That's not a, a, a criminal issue. That's a civil tort issue for you lying. Same with fire? Uh, you'd pro Yeah, you'd probably get sued by the business, but it's not a matter of uh, law. But, it's not, but, it's not but, a matter of uh, criminal law. But let's go back. She's she's a, head, a, a leader at the organization, I, I assume, and she's saying, well, what is free speech? Mm. Well, this was her, yeah. uh, she was relaying a question from, from employees. Yeah. Also, so the woman was getting questions and she was asking the CEO. It's mm -hmm. indicative that they still don't know what it is if they're still asking the question. Also, I believe when uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes said you can't shout fire in a crowded theater, he was using that as a justification for censoring people who were protesting the First World War. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and that really? got overturned, I think it was yeah. like 1968. Yeah. So they'd go into so, a theater and yell just to get people riled no, up? No, no. So they were not actual, he was using it as an analogy. They were passing out flyers that protested the First World War, and they ruled that you shouldn't be able to do that. And his justification is, well, you can't yell fire in a crowded theater, so you can't do this either. Some people are pointing out that um, Parag Agrawal is, was not born in the United States. And so the oh. CEO who is dictating our speech is, uh, that, that's very problematic that someone who isn't you know, from this country. Uh, my response to that is, Elon Musk was also not born in this yeah, country true. and would also be dictating speech in this country. So um, yeah, either way, you've got that problem. So is it an issue? I suppose the issue is, are our values being upheld? And Twitter, you know what I think Twitter is? It is, um, you guys ever play the game Life Genesis on, on old Windows 95? Negative. You don't remember that one? Mm -mm. So uh, it's a bunch of little dots, little squares, pixels that interact with each other in unique ways, and it creates predictable, it creates patterns based on certain rules. And uh, in the version I had, you had two colors. So basically... If you have 100 blue pixels and you drop one red into it, the red gets engulfed instantly. It just becomes blue. That's what Twitter is. Twitter is 98.7% Democrat uh, voting, Democrat donating. Anybody who goes in there and is conservative is crushed instantly. Their ideas don't make it anywhere. You're not going to be sitting in a Twitter meeting and they say, how do we deal with this, this, this problem of harassment and be the lone conservative being like, uh, it's not harassment. What are you talking about? You're going to keep your mouth shut because you're one out of you know 30 people and you know they'll harass you. They'll take your job from you. So you do nothing. All of the policies then start moving further and further to the left and going insane. And so the people at Twitter genuinely do not understand how insane they've driven themselves. As I've often described it, Jack Dorsey built a big toilet and then stuck his mouth on the end of it and started eating the refuse he created. I know it's a crass way to describe it, but this is what happened. People went on Twitter, started saying insane things to get traffic. The more insane they got, the more Jack himself was surrounded by the insanity that he had welcomed. So what happens then is I'm sitting down with Jack and Vijaya and Joe Rogan. And I said, yeah, your rules are overtly biased. Your rules outright. And Jack says, no, they're not. And I was like, you have a misgendering policy. You can't see that that is an outright biased rule that conservatives are, are confused by? And he was like, but we're trying to help people who might be suicidal. And I'm like, you're not helping body dysmorphic people. You're not helping transracial people. No, you live in a bubble. You live in a bubble you can't see out of. So you've enacted policies that are insane to the average person. And that's for a minuscule percentage of the population. You're changing all the yep. norms for a minority of a minority of the population. But we're talking specifically, I would say the minority is the leftists. 
It's 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 not even Blair Blair White is is a trans person. Blair White doesn't agree with with what these people are saying. It's not even an issue of, in my opinion, trans issues. It's an issue of ideology. So what happens is you have white progressive liberals who claim everyone else is racist. They claim Candace Owens is a white supremacist. They claim Larry Elder is the is the black face of white supremacy. It is their fringe ideology that is dominating and getting these rules made. It's not even an issue of are black people upset over racism? Yes, many are, but they're not the ones enacting these changes. They're not the ones going into Twitter and demanding Twitter do these things for them. Some activists are, some aren't. It is this weird fringe cult that is going in and making rules for everybody else while believing that they're the white well, saviors. And you also have the issue of the trans agenda, which is trying to groom people that have dysphoria or issues or might be migrating to being actually gay and say, you're not actually gay, you are trans. And you need surgery, and you need. I, to but but again, though that that's white progressive women doing that. Correct. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's not a, so so you know a lot of people bring up the idea of like a trans agenda or whatever, and I'll say okay in the context that doesn't refer to an individual who is transgender, it refers to the cult, because when you see a video of a white liberal woman who is a straight married woman, but she's talking about how she wants to teach kids these things, it's an issue of the cult, white weird progressive fringe politics i believe social media has has wrapped them into a bubble of insanity where they push policies that regular people think are insane hmm. i want to make it it's possible i'm being pedantic with myself here i want to make a slight correction the 1919 court case we were referring to about yelling fire in a private theater it wasn't even the person protesting the first world war i looked it up to double check they were just protesting the draft in the First World War. Oh. So it's even worse than that. But I wanted to point that out. And Sam, I hear what you're saying, but I think it's fair to call it the trans agenda because even though not every single person who's considered to be transgender is on board with it, it seems to be how they're unified and behaving as a political force. I, that's what I'm saying. If you're saying it's an agenda to encourage transgender or gender ideology, mm -hmm. sure. If you're saying it's a trans agenda as if transgender people are the ones behind it, I would say right. I disagree with that because there, for one, the transgender community is, is very, very small. And if you go on Twitter and if you look at these videos, it is typically like white liberal women. However, there are many non-binary individuals who are advocating for this stuff too. I'm not saying they're not. I'm just saying I think it's important to call out the ideology while recognizing we're friends with Blair White, who's amazing and doesn't agree with them. We also have a similar situation with white liberals, male and female, pushing the Im the immigration agenda. That is not the dominant theme or the dominant issue for the Hispanic community in this country, regardless if they're f from South America, Cuba, Port Puerto Rico, or any place else. Okay, it's being pushed by the white liberals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I should mention this. Of the Hispanic people I have met who are legal immigrants, they are not a fan. They are not fans of illegal immigration. So the idea that like this is an issue that is being pushed by you know Hispanic voters as a block is ridiculous. You're right. Very often it's just it's white liberals who want to pat themselves on the back, virtue signaling, or big businesses that want cheap labor. Well, let's talk about what the next step is because um, my friends, if you thought Elon Musk was going to save you, I'm sorry. We may have won a battle. I tell you, this moment is like the battle for Helm's Deep. Oh boy. And we made one last ride. And then up in the, in the break of dawn, we saw Elon Musk, the white wizard, coming to our rescue. But the war is not over. We still have to get the one ring of censorship to Mount Doom. <laughs> and uh, what's happening now is the Biden administration is calling for Section 230 reform. Obama has called for more regulations on speech. You've got Ed Markey calling for... Uh, algorithmic justice, he called it. <laughs> Lawmakers are calling for greater oversight of social media. According to the White House, Biden has long argued that tech platforms must be held accountable. When they lose in the private sector, where they've controlled the narrative for so long, they are falling back to the public sector and they're going to try to use government as their cudgel to beat people down and maintain that narrative. So battle may be won, but we must get the ring of censorship to Mount Doom. Yeah, so when Biden says they need to be held accountable for the harms they caused, do you think he might be referring to the fact that they suppressed a true story about his son, which in part contributed to him being elected as president of the United States? Yes, well, they're definitely. losing that power. Elon Musk publicly comes yeah. out and says they should not have done that, yeah. and Joe Biden's like, oh, geez, man, like, how am I going to win in like, 2024? Come on, man. 
Come on, man. I can't, I can't win an election without <laughs> big tech censoring people and, and shutting down conversations around what my kid does. Ask Time Magazine. I can't. I can't. I can't what am I going to do? What's their oversight that they want to create? On this? It's, it's, it's nebulous. Oh, geez. But they're like, we can't allow disinformation. I don't think they'll win. Well, but they've already... I mean, they've already started doing this. Remember, they were telling large social media platforms that they had to censor certain information surrounding COVID-19. And they did. Yeah. And we saw that uh, wasn't like media companies getting uh, subsidy on like vaccine issues or something like that. Absolutely right. When when uh, what did we see? The Democratic Party went to Twitter. I think it was saying certain people should be banned. And it was uh, we had Tom Fitton just the other day who was, who was talking about that. So yeah. I, right, right, right. There was some kind of expose they did where the Democrats were actually sending messages like, hey, get rid of these people. The coordination between the White House and the tech media companies has been, I think, eye opening and it's scary. And the collaboration and, and the coordination between the two is what McCarthy should investigate if they get the majority. And they're going to need subpoenas and they're going to need preservation of record requests and those should go out now. And it's going to be very hard, even if you have an aggressive Republican leadership in the House of Representatives, to get after this because you're going to face resistance, delays, stalling tactics from the administration and the White House, the executive privilege issues, all of that. And they'll try to run out the clock, but they have to go after it. You have to begin the fight. And just like with putting up your billboard, Tim, you have to fight. You have to let them know there's going to be a cost. You have to give an example to others. Our base needs it, okay? People need the example to stand up and fight and go to meetings and participate in the democracy. And they need to see their leaders standing up. I don't think Kevin McCarthy is gonna, gonna do anything. I don't disagree with him. <laughs> <laughs> Just ran in his parade over here. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, there's hope, but there's also hope that one could get a different leader. Hmm. Uh, that's what we need. We need uh, a Speaker Trump, maybe. I, what are they going to vote for? I have the greatest speaker. I'd like to ask you something. So I'm really curious about how new this relationship between the White House and these large social media companies is. Was there any inkling when you were in the White House that things like this had been occurring under the Obama administration prior to Trump taking power? Absolutely right. Ben Rhodes talked about how foolish the major mainstream media is and the tech leadership. He had that he could manipulate them and he made fun of them in private. It came out and he was embarrassed by that. But the key issue is that he was facilitating and coordinating this with daily messaging for coordinating the White House messages and the CNNs and the MSNBCs, but also the social media lapped it up. So we had that beginning in the Obama administration. I'd say previously you also had, but it wasn't as coordinated or as effective as we saw with you know, the advent of social media really growing during the Obama years. I mean, it's 12 years ago, 14 years ago now, right? So things have moved along quite quickly. I, I think we've got real problems here. And I think, you know, we're going to have to begin the turn. The turn is possible, but it's going to take aggressive oversight. It's probably going to take another executive uh, leader like a Trump or a DeSantis or someone to come in and put some teeth in DOJ and SEC and the Federal Communications Administration to get after this in a way that will level the playing field. You got to change the culture in these industries. And that comes with the green, I think. You got to drain the swamp. Yeah. Yes. But you look at what happens to Robbie Starbuck. Mm -hmm. Do you hear about what happened to him in Tennessee? No. no. They kicked him off the primary. The Republican yeah. Party did. They said he wasn't a real Republican. It's the dude is more Repu like one of the most Republican Republicans there is. That should be challenged in court because I think it's violating a number of laws. I mean, constitutional requirements here to drop someone off running in, in the primary can uh, primary race there in Tennessee. I read something about it. I don't remember exactly what the story was, but I, it appeared that it's an overreach by the Republican yep. Party there. But it's the establishment. It's the establishment going after the base of the party. Yep. Mm -hmm. If we're going to actually see any changes in November, if the Republicans going to win, there has to be a wave of populist American first type uh, America first type Republicans who win. But if the Republican Party itself is rejecting these candidates and trying to keep them out, then why would I bother voting for a Republican? Well, we have a lot of wins. You know, we've seen that in Michigan and other places. Okay. 
and it looks like it's going to be good in Georgia and it's going to be good in North Carolina. And I think we're not in too bad a place in places like uh, Texas. Um, I, I actually, I think maybe it would be fair for me to say that until the Republican Party itself at the national level comes down on Tennessee with, with an iron fist, weeding out the corruption and condemning the actions in booting Robbie Starbuck off, we should advocate that everyone tells the Republican Party to go screw themselves. I'm not going to vote. I'm not voting for Republicans until they make that move and restore Robbie Starbuck. Because I don't want, I'm not going to be party to corruption. If they want to play stupid, pathetic, dirty games, if the Rep Republicans of West Virginia, of Maryland, of, of, at the national level will not come out and condemn this, I'll tell you this, if they condemn it, I'm good. Well, in you Maryland, in Maryland, right here where we're at, the state Republican Party is trying to pressure county committees of the Republican Party to not support Dan Cox in the governor's race. Mm. Okay, that's Governor Hogan, okay, trying to stack the deck in favor of his chosen successor yep. against a real conserv conservative who's been endorsed by President Trump. So, so, uh, well, elaborate on this. Tell us more about what, you know, what's going on. Well, what they're trying to do is influence every county. Every county in Maryland has a, uh, a committee of Republican leaders, and they are elected, and, and if there's a... a, a replacement needed they're appointed and it's approved by the governor they're trying and they're very important in county politics and they're pressuring them to not provide any support that means organizing help for the campaign at the grassroots level and disincentivizing people from doing that as individuals too and that could stack the deck now i think the reaction is going to be in places like garrett and allegheny county and washington county and others that are basically conservative in trump territory it's going to it's going to not it's not going to work at all okay when you say that they're they, pressuring they, them what is an example of that kind of pressure withholding support denying them access they're not going to get the benefits of being part of the the op it, larger state operation is that not blackmail call it what you will it's, it's politics. The it is politics. The establishment, be it Republican or Democrat, are happy to see the Republicans fail and lose if it means populists, people like Trump, and people who like Trump don't win. So what's the solution? I don't know. They, I, I genuinely think, you know, do I think that Lindsey Graham cares at all? Hmm. No. He high five. He fist bumped Kamala Harris. He does not care. He is a crony establishment shill. We did it, Lindsay. Yeah, so is Kevin McCarthy. So is Mitch McConnell. They're all terrible. The Republican Party is despised by so many people in this country, and it's sad because there, there are good. There are more good Republicans than, uh, than good Democrats, but the Republican Party is just run by, by pure corruption. The, and the Democrats are too, don't get me wrong. The Chamber of Commerce Republican elite, okay, and I, I call it the uniparty elite because there's not that much difference. George Wallace once said there's not a dime worth of difference between the leadership of the Republican and Democratic Party. That was back in 1968 or 72, something like that. That's ancient history for most people, but that's what was said, and it's more true today than back then, okay? Mm -hmm. The uniparty elite has sold out to China, the Chamber of Commerce supports both of them. Leadership in, in banks and venture capital, capital, they give big money to victory funds for Republicans at the senior level. They give the same kind of money to the Democrats because it's all about the green for them and yep. you know feathering their nest. Yeah, there's a, I quote it, I uh, quote this every now and again on the show, but it's called Woods's Law from Tom Woods. Whoever you vote for, you end up getting John McCain. Mm. Uh, and it's true that in terms of the actual party platforms, yes, the parties are different. I certainly don't agree that they're identical, but I completely agree with you that at the level of leadership, they're pretty much all in bed together. Let's. I, I, I do want to at least talk about a reason why you should vote against Democrats. Not that I think it's perfect to vote for Republicans, yeah. but we have this story from TimCast.com. Amazon leadership held a session to discuss Matt Walsh's best-selling children's book, Johnny the Walrus, being problematic. A customer said that it's teaching kids to kill and bully transgender people. What? This hmm? is Matt Walsh's book. This is Amazon being insane and going over the top. Now, I, I, there's not much to say beyond this. We know Amazon does this. We know who they are. That's the news. My point is, the reason why I would like to vote for a Republican is to get rid of this stuff. I want school boards to say, look, we don't want critical praxis in our schools. What does the left say? Republicans are banning math. And this works because there are people who just watch CNN. They believe it. 
And then I'll respond and say, nobody banned math. Well, what about Ron DeSantis banning math books? He banned math books that were filled with critical praxis. I don't want books banned. I want curriculum of critical praxis and Christian praxis banned because kids should be taught two plus two equals four. Moving on. If the kid says, I have a question about mommies and daddies, talk to your parents about it. If the kid yeah. says, I have a question about my spirituality and my faith, back, talk to your parents about it. Keep it out of the schools. Praxis, I, the implementation of the ideology should be kept out. If those are the rules we're playing by, I'm totally fine with it. Amen, man. <laughs> Good story. What we need is more candidates to step up and run for election <clears throat> that believe in the things that you believe, Tim, <clears throat> that believe that CRT in the classroom is wrong. We need more people running like the parents in Loudoun County who challenged the school board. We need people to stand up and we need people to show up to vote. And that's how you take the party back and that's how you bring real change. It doesn't happen overnight. It didn't happen overnight for Ronald Reagan who first made the speech in 1964 in support of Barry Goldwater. It took 20 years. So it's, it's uh, I have no issue if a school has a book on critical race theory in the school. I have no problem if the school has a Bible in the school. I have no problem if the teachers say, look, I don't care. We don't want to ban those books. You can read it. You can ask questions about it. Well, my issue is with what's called praxis. In this instance, it's not critical race theory. It's critical race applied principles or critical race praxis. The left calls it critical race praxis, which is the implementation of the ideology in other subjects. An example would be writing a math problem that says, Seamus is a white male who is stopped by police and frisked seven times per year. Andre is a black man who is stopped 247 times per year. What percentage of stops are... So it's supposed to be a math problem, but they inject critical race theory into it, and that's the praxis. Now, we call it critical race applied principles because that spells crap, and we don't <laughs> want crap in our schools. Um, but no, in all seriousness, the, the left doesn't call it critical race praxis, which is already three, uh, CRP, which is crap, basically. Well, race well, has an RA in it, so you could just call it crap as well. well crap. It's just funny how pedantic we have to get about distinguishing between these different forms of left-wing thought which are near identical as conservatives when they just say everyone who disagrees with them is a nazi and that's the one label that they use well the problem i think is they lie all the time yeah and it works yeah look at the story they then lie about uh, taylor lorenz a great example she went on cnn and said the right-wing media lies and it's fascinating because that's she, projection. That's always yes. projection well, it's, on their it's part. It's Darvo, yeah. right? D deny, you know, attack, reverse, victim and offender. It's them who's lying. You can only trust me. It's people like Brian Stelter who tells you not to watch Fox News. Mm. Mika because, Brzezinski is guilty of that, too. Right. Explaining that it's her job to tell you what to think. <laughs> well, that's our job. And then they denied it later. And then Snopes comes out and says, that's not true. It never happened. Or, or Joe Biden reaching out to shake the hand of somebody that's not there. And then the, and Snopes comes out and says, he never did it. Or what was it? What was it? Snopes? I think it was Snopes. He, he never actually did it. And it's like, dude, you're fact checking an opinion with your own opinion. Yeah. You're just lying. That's that, that's what they do. It's the game they play. And then they come up with something like the 1619 Project, the New oh. York Times, and they infuse our schools with it, which is an ideologically driven fabrication of American history, especially the founding. The founding fathers, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution was opposed to slavery. Only two Initially. states. And only two, that's right. In the declaration, the declaration really did mean all men are created equal. Two states opposed it: Georgia and South Carolina. It, you had to compromise at that time. The letters, the history, really tells you that it really wasn't based upon slavery or racism. That there was really a movement to move beyond that and oppose slavery. One of, one of the original uh, grievances in the Declaration of Independence was that the king had taken people from their homeland, brought them there against their will, and was using them to wage war against them. They, uh, Jefferson took that out because the southern states that were pro-slavery would not sign on so long as the other colonists uh, and, and leaders opposed slavery. Now, they had slaves, and it was bad. A lot of bad things happened. Many countries still have slaves. It's, it's really, really bad. But that, that I think, I, I don't know if that was the, bi uh, the biggest mistake made, or but it was a big mistake because that divide, that compromise, it didn't end there. That, that, that uh, tacit agreement of, look, we'll overlook this for now so we can win a revolution. And then 80 years later, we're in civil war. And now, you know, and then 80 years after that, well, World War II, but we'll, that's not domestic. 
you ended up with Jim Crow laws, you ended up with the Klan, you ended up with this conflict that was just ne seemingly never ending. And if you look back at everything we're dealing with today, it's all rooted going all the way back to even before this. The problem is they need you to believe that the founding fathers were evil so that they can justify destroying American culture because from the ashes of the old, they will build the new. Correct. They want a completely different system. What they want is a multicultural democracy. People need to understand when Elizabeth Warren comes out and says this is dangerous for our democracy and these Democrats say this, they are not referring to your country because you, good sir watching this show, believe in a constitutional republic, not a democracy. And conservatives say, you're wrong. We're not a democracy. We're a constitutional republic. No, you don't know. You misunderstand. They are telling you that there is a new multicultural democracy growing in the United States. They're not making mistakes about and it. And they're going after the symbolism. They want to invalidate the 4th of July. They want to deny its value. And they want to move to a June 19th type of celebration that will overshadow the July 4th celebration. I do think it's odd that we celebrate the introductions to war so often, like Pearl Harbor, July 4th. What other days got us into war that we celebrate? I don't know. But th then 9-11? 9-11 was another we, one. Like, but not mm. celebrate. We don't, well, you could say we, we observe. We observe yeah. and or celebrate. The 4th of July is definitely a celebration. Why don't we celebrate the day that the war ended? Oh, good point. We but did. July 4th. Veterans Day, right? Yeah. July Veterans 4th. Day is the only example I could find. And they changed the name from Armistice Day, Armistice celebrating Day, the end of the right. war, to Veterans Day, celebrating the warriors themselves. But by the way, we were at war for a year before the Declaration of Independence. Mm. Technically way longer than that. So uh, the, the American re uh, War for Independence took 20 years. And uh, a lot of these, these, these moments, I mean, they were going back 10 or so, 20 years before, or I think 10 or so years before the signing of the Declaration. So the, the, the British regulars shooting people, the conflict, the confiscations, all that was going on. It just wasn't at the point of people marching towards each other. I think that they celebrate the inductions into war because it's war propaganda. They use it like, remember that we're the victim and we had to fight. Uh, I don't know. I, that's, how I, that's how I've been phrasing it. So maybe... I don't know what's up with the June the June nineteenth thing that you were talking about. What is that exactly? That was the day that Union soldiers made it to the uh, last place in the country in Texas. I think it was Gal was it Galveston? Yeah, where uh, the last slaves had not been informed they were free men, and oh. finally ended slavery. Okay, so it's worth celebrating as a end of slavery kind of thing. I, think I don't think it has anything cool. to do with July Fourth though. I don't no. know why those two would be in the same conversation. I I, I think Juneteenth is cool. I think I think like you know we get a holiday in June to have barbecue and celebrate freedom and independence. I'm totally for it. Slavery was abhorrent, and it took that long to get rid of it. I say we do another holiday and we celebrate the end of slavery, the real end of slavery, and we also have the Fourth of July, when our founding fathers set forth a new nation that was one of the first at the time to challenge these these monarchs, these absolute authorities, and say of for and by the people. Was it perfect? No, but it planted these seeds. And of the seeds planted, we were uh, blessed with people like Frederick Douglass, who challenged the American people to uphold the words that they themselves had put in their own constitution about all men being created equal, which ultimately led to the abolition of slavery. And many other countries retain slavery and still have slavery to this day. Slavery was bad. The 4th of July, Declaration of Independence, the Constitution are all good things. Juneteenth is also also a good thing. I will take two holidays. Absolutely. I think it's fantastic. Yeah. Well, but also, for whatever reason, we are a nation which doesn't want to celebrate the fact that we ended slavery. We want to scold ourselves for the fact that it ever happened, even though virtually every culture throughout all of history has had some form of it, and we ended it. Well, it's a political cudgel, but the Democrats wield it all the time. But if you go back and, you know, Louis Gohmert did a good monologue on that on the House floor about the history of the Democratic Party and slavery. They were the South, the South in the Civil War. They were Jim Crow. They were the KKK. Mm -hmm. They were the anti They reinstituted segregation under Wood Woodrow Wilson, okay? Segregated the government and the army again. So, you know, the Democratic Party acts as though they are the defenders of freedom and, and of the slaves, but they were the ones behind it for most of the American and, history. And, and they're also the party that just tried to repeal the civil rights provisions from the California Constitution only a couple mm -hmm. years ago. Yeah, it's funny. I was thinking about this the other day. They also argue that there was a party switch. And so the Democratic Party can't be held accountable or looked upon negatively for the fact that they supported slavery, they supported Jim Crow, etc. And yet, when you look at the nation as a whole, 
everyone is to blame, right? Basically, all white Americans are to blame to some extent for slavery, even though it ended, uh, the, the history of it still remains. But then when you talk about the Democratic Party, oh, well, the legacy of that just disappeared instantly, right? The, the party switched, and then the legacy of slavery and racism within the Democratic Party just vanished overnight. And not, not in the country as a whole, just in, like, the pocket where it's convenient for us to say it disappeared, Shameless. even though studies show that white liberals dumb their language down when they talk to black people. Every, it, it, was, it was actually this one moment where every single Democrat, like a strike of lightning, <laughs> exactly. just went, I was wrong! Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the whole country changed. It's true. Yeah. And yeah. every Republican was hit. At once. Conversely, by that same lightning. It's like, oh, and we're racist was like, now. <laughs> 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 oh, no! They've sent their racism to us! No, they, they would say, oh, no, they would go, oh, yes! <laughs> 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 well, let's, let's talk about uh, what's going on here in Washington County. So, for those that aren't familiar, um, we are in Western Maryland, and uh, we're, uh, I live in West Virginia officially, but we work out of Western Maryland, and I, I don't think we'll be doing that much longer because I think that the policies of the state are insane. And what you often see is leftists not understanding how taxes work, mm -mm. not understanding how businesses work. We just actually, there's a really great tweet, David Hogg. You know the guy from Parkland? <laughs> really? You see, yes. You see this tweet? He's, no, he I did. tweeted. It's very funny. It's too Absolutely. difficult to Absolutely. form an LLC. This is ridiculous. Yeah. There's too many regulations. And people were like, accidental conservative moment. No, it's a, it's a young kid who did not realize how difficult it is uh, often. Now, when you get old, you get experienced. It's actually relatively easy. But uh, I'll tell you the challenges. The first formation of a company I did was confusing and very difficult because we didn't. Imagine someone walks up to you and they hand you five bowling pins and say, juggle. You'll be like, okay, okay, okay I, I can't do that. And they'll be like, figure it out. Take you a long time to figure it out. Once you get the hang of it, you can mix it up and you're juggling. You're like, I know how to do this. Yeah, where I'm at now with this company, it's really easy to start companies and, and, and work with it. But I have a team, we have accountants, we have lawyers. For a regular person, it's so difficult. And so what we end up seeing with many people on the left is they don't start companies. So they have no idea what's going on. No, they go to government. Mm -hmm. And then the government passes laws like, how do we increase tax revenue? I know, increase taxes. Well, I'll tell you what the result of that is. We're leaving. Yeah. We're yep. moving our headquarters over. We've been building Free Domestan for a few months. We already have many employees who are already reporting out of there. And we're going to move everything to West Virginia because we're 10 minutes away. Because it's almost heaven. Yeah. Basically. Yes. Yeah. Is that is that the slogan or <laughs> something? John Denver. That's some John Denver oh, song. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But no, I think it's funny. Every time someone on the left tries to do something even remotely productive, they end up dropping some kind of conservative take about it. He's like, yeah, man, it's really hard to start this company. It's like, oh my I goodness, he did something in the real world. And this was now he has a conservative opinion. <laughs> How well, interesting. This is interesting. Um, Jen Perlman, who we've had on the show, um, who is a progressive Democrat, was tweeting about uh, billionaires paying their fair share. And I said, how much do you think is fair? Is 55% a fair share? Mm -hmm. And Jen responded that perhaps 25 to 30%, if you get rid of the loopholes, was a fair share. And so I said, are you saying you would want to reduce the tax burden on billionaires if you could close the loopholes? And they said, yeah, I think so. And I'm like, I don't know if I agree with that completely, but that's an interesting take. Uh, I also wonder if they really understand what loopholes mean. Mm -hmm. I don't think they do. No, because I don't think they would be arguing for that if they understood what the tax, loop, tax loophole really was. Well, a lot of the tax loopholes, what they call loopholes, are built in to incentivize businesses, investors, entrepreneurs to do things that the government wants them to do, to get them involved in economic zones in underprivileged areas, uh, low income areas. It's about trying to bring in high tech businesses and give them a tax break in an yep. area like Washington County. So you get high tech companies coming in instead of low paying uh, warehouse jobs. Why would they call that a loophole and not a tax break incentive? Because they don't actually want people to be incentivized to do good things. Why they don't... just want to punish anyone who's more successful than them. I, no, it's or... because, look, I think most of them never, never ran a business. Yep. They don't pay business taxes. In their mind, they were told evil billionaires aren't paying their fair share. Yes. The problem I have with that is I'm like, look, I'm with Steve with uh, with Bannon on this one. Tax the rich. However, I don't think giving the government like the, the idea in and of itself, but government's not going to do a good job with it. So I don't know how I ultimately feel with the end results of that. But the issue is they don't actually have a definition of what fair means. Yeah, fair share rhymes. It's catchy. It's a rhetoric. It doesn't it's meaningless. Really mean anything. That's why I said it's fifty five percent fair. 
You're not going to get a, a straight answer. Fair. Welcome world. to Earth, dude. Mm. Fairness. Come on. But when you look at, say, the income tax, 50% of people that earn income do not pay an income tax. Right. And the top 1% pay a tremendous, I don't know what the number is, but it's an overwhelming amount. So if you actually break down the uh, tax burden um, uh, by bracket, most people receive more benefits from taxes than they pay into it. Most people, even up to like 100 or 200K per year. It's only around or, or after that people start actually paying taxes, and it's the overwhelmingly the one percent and the billionaires who are paying the taxes that fund the benefits for all of the poor. I like I like that. I'm, I have no problem with that. That's why I have a problem with with the government being unaccountable, with being bloated and corrupt. The idea that rich people or you know we, we pay a percentage in taxes, and that goes to helping poor people have cleaner water or roads. I like it. You know, mm-hmm. the, we're only as strong as our weakest link, the, but we don't have that. Yeah, We've the, got a broken tax system. We've got leftists who don't understand it, who are being manipulated, then impose tax laws which hurt their own states. And we have bloated government that siphons money off for BS reasons, we have like gender, Pakistani gender studies. Corporations that are considered multinational that bounce from country to country depending on the tax levels. They have bank accounts in Panama. The Panama Papers breaks and shows all these people have like, they're hoarding their wealth offshores. This is the real life reality. So how do you deal with that? Corporations aren't going to sit around and pay you exorbitant taxes. They're just going to move their money well, offshore. Can I give yep. you an example? I've been campaigning and I've been going door to door. I'm trying to hit 200 to 250 homes every day, talking to people that are paying taxes, older people in, in their homes, younger people just getting started with young kids. And in Washington County, we have a tremendous surplus. The amount might be 40, 50 million dollars in excess revenue. They're talking about a $3 million property tax cut for the whole county. That will amount to about $50 for an average family making $50,000 a year living in a moderate-priced home of about $180,000. $50 total rebate. The assessments in, in this county, we get reassessed. One-third of the houses get reassessed every year. The assessments are going up, so it's going to be almost $100 a month more for that average house. So we're giving $50 back, but we're taking $1,150 from them. That's driving elder people out of their homes. They're a part of the fabric of the community. We want the grandparents and the elderly to be there because they're part of that community. They're important. But they're having to leave for West Virginia, for Pennsylvania, or go to Florida. So Maryland is a ridiculous state, and the taxes are so insane. West Virginia is literally, you know, a hand. Uh, you, you, we, we could drive a half an hour, and we're at our new uh, headquarters. Is that half an hour drive? Is it worth losing hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars? That, well, that's ridiculous. So Maryland, it doesn't seem to understand that. I, you know, I understand maybe for like a brick and mortar business, but the nature of our business and the growth we're having, we have no choice but to leave the state. And that means Maryland will end up up losing tax revenue instead of just saying we will compete for your business with with West Virginia. You could have something where like certain areas of Maryland have a tax, certain tax rate, but the further west you go, it starts to go down. So it becomes a little more like the neighboring states. They do the opposite. They they increase. So uh, the way it works is if you're a resident of West Virginia and you work in Maryland, they charge you an additional tax. Wow. Instead of saying thank you for bringing your business here. They say, we're going to punish you for bringing your business here. Yeah. Well, and people don't really understand that this is a matter of incentives. Like you said, that it, that's what it is. It's a punishment. Of course, no nothings look at that and go, hey, they're raising money for our budget. I've discussed and broken down the Laffer curve on this show before. A lot of lefties who don't know anything about economics, which is to say most lefties, will actually tell you the Laffer curve doesn't exist. That's not true. No left-wing economist even says that. The disagreement is just over where the parabola peaks. Conservative-leaning economists tend to say it's somewhere near 20%. Left-wing economists might say as high as 70% if they're really crazy. But ultimately, people are not going to work for money when they can't keep as much of it. It's really basic stuff. I just think it's a tremendous oversight for there to be a tri-state area between Virginia, Maryland, West Virginia. And Maryland's like, we're going to make it more expensive. Mm-hmm. So everyone's just like, why would I be in Maryland? Well, that's similar to Illinois. Illinois is surrounded by red states, yeah. lower taxes, higher productiv- productivity, more economic growth. And Illinois is losing population. The taxes go up because the more people that leave, 
The more yep. the producers leave, the more those left behind have to pay to s support the gargantuan government apparatus that's in place. Mm -hmm. Grassroots Atlas Shrugged. Well, you know, we see evidence of this kind of thing in the real world, too. So despite all of the lies the media said to convince people otherwise, after the Trump tax cuts, we saw a revenue increase. Our deficit increased as well because increased spending outpaced the increase in revenue. But the left used the fact that the deficit increased to argue that we lost revenue. It actually wasn't the case. They were just lying about it. But when you tax people less, they have more incentive to and, work and they generate more wealth for the economy. And then take a look. It's not just your income tax. It's not just your property tax. It's the higher gasoline Mm. tax it's the higher sales tax it's the fees that they pay us on on cable direct tv the water costs more all these things are passed on okay mm -hmm. more so here than in west virginia mm -hmm. well and they know this it's interesting they know this because when it comes to taxing cigarettes or alcohol or even gasoline it's understood that there's an agenda there and the agenda is we want people to use less of this so they're willing to recognize when it's convenient for them that when you increase taxes on something you end up with a less productive market there you're not able to sell as much of it and yet when it comes to human labor they're completely blind to it you know what else is interesting this crypto stuff uh they didn't start taxing it till like 2018 i think uh, and so basically there's like another $700 billion in the economy that maybe isn't accounted for right now that untaxed just wealth was just created out of nothing. So that's true. Considering, uh, the mass printing of money and the explosion in the money supply, I'm not sure if $700 billion has put a dent in it. Yeah. Right. It's up to 2, tr 2 trillion in crypto I, value you know, look, thereabouts. It's, it's fluctuates. West Virginia has got constitutional carry. Mm -hmm. There you go. It's, it's just. Western Maryland, I guess the way the states have structured themselves, they can't adapt properly fast enough. I don't know. It just seems ridiculous to me that the current system is too sluggish to realize the, uh, the Western Maryland system. They're going to be losing prominent industry. Why did they not make it so you could pay taxes online when you were at the White House? I don't know if you were involved with the economic stuff at all, but like it's an act of Congress. Like, why would they not focus on streamlining that process so you can go and click a few buttons, have your payment go direct from your bank account? Instead, they make you like file all this paperwork and search for things and go to this, and then they can't, and then it's like I got to pay them. And well, mail. that's 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 like yo, twenty totally first century. It's it's totally I'm talking different. about their incompetence and sluggishness to well, no, adapt. No, no, no. This is lo lobbying. There's, there's big companies that make billions of dollars off of tax filing preparation. Well, here oh, here's the wow. question I have for you. I I took two months with Facebook to try and get validated to have a campaign page. It took me two months, and they even used snail mail in the process, which slowed the pro the whole thing down. I sold my house from the time I called the internet company Open Door until I got a check in the mail. It took me 13 days. I never saw a person. Huh. Yet Facebook, a modern company, two months to validate me as a person to be able to run political ads. Yep. Bureaucracy. So, is it this? Is yep. they're too big? The American government has too many people working there. Mm. Yes. Nothing <laughs> ever gets smaller. No programs ever die. Nope. Exactly. Uh, that's float. Uh, they got to know that if, if you hang on to a dying system and you refuse to shred, sh shred it apart, it's going to get overthrown. Like that's the inevitable. If you look at history from but thousands and thousands of years in the past, that's what happens with societies if you refuse, right. refuse to reform. But, but what happens is as the culture starts to decay and break down, many people recognize we need a reform or it's going to fall apart. And once that happens, people say, well, I can't count on you, so I better grab as much silverware as possible as the yeah. ship sinks. And that's the that's, mass and, and then they that's call, what's happening right now. We've gone through things like reinventing government. Okay, that was a big thing. I think in, in the Clinton years, we had George Bush reinvent and redesign the whole intelligence community, sixteen agencies, and develop the de defense. I mean, the de Department of National Intelligence. It didn't solve anything really. It just created another layer of bureaucracy, more jobs more elite, but it's not any better. Did you guys consider defaulting on the interest of the Federal Reserve? I wasn't involved in that. That would have been Mr. Munchen and, you know, others, so. But let's ask the audience. Yes. Did you ever consider defaulting on the debt to the Federal Reserve? <laughs> Just uh, the interest, get, the interest. Just the interest. Just a, we'll start so uh, get those super chats in. We're going to read your comments. Smash the like button if you haven't already. Head over to TimCast.com. Become a member. We're going to have a members-only segment coming up. 
around 11 p.m. Seamus, what do you by the way, I want to say it wasn't a super chat, but I glanced over at the right moment and noticed that someone in chat said, interesting that the guy with the Irish flag behind him just commented on alcohol taxes. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> All right. Let's read what some super chats. You know? We got Andre who says something definitely changed in Twitter's algorithm. All of a sudden, I'm getting hundreds of likes on my comments, many replies. I'm pretty sure I didn't become super witty overnight. You see, this is what I'm saying. It's not just follower count. All of a sudden, people are getting crazy engagement. Yeah, yeah. I have my tweet from yesterday has more than double the likes of any other tweet I've ever put out. You were un... Listen, Ian, do you think conservatives like you? I think everybody likes me. No, but I mean, yeah. like, obviously, they, they're, they're critical of you. You know, probably yeah. People are critical of me in general, but, yeah. but does it does it make sense that the people like when you you'll, you'll get a mixed reaction sometimes? You'll get ones or twenties. Yeah, yeah. Does it make sense that all of a sudden everyone just agreed with you and liked your stuff? No, this is completely um, anomalous. I, I'm not. I don't know. I mean, it was a great tweet. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> when we win a battle, I do not celebrate. I focus on how to win the next battle. Do, do girls you're meeting in bars now like you? That's probably what. It's all my old girlfriends are <laughs> finally country. liking my stuff. <laughs> all right, all right, girl, ladies, Play. I'm back. All right, we got Raymond G. Stanley Jr. says, just because, more fight back. Oh, thank, thank you, you. very much. Yeah. Morick says, do a Vosh versus Alex Jones debate on free speech, trans, and culture war. No, uh, no matter the harm to my <laughs> eardrums, I will subscribe uh, a years to listen to that. Thank you, Elon. Twitter is now a better place. Mm -hmm. Well, Vosh has the very uh, calm and slow talk. Well, Alex, you need to understand that you can't make that argument. And Alex would be screaming, you know, ah, you know. Maybe. Say. But uh, look, as much as I can say Vosh is one of the few leftists who will come on the show and people have a lot to criticize him over, especially with the kids and the, and the grooming mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, I'd like to have a different leftist come on and debate somebody, but they don't want to do it. Uh, uh, Matt Bender said he was going to email us. Did he? No, nope, haven't seen that email. Because I told him to email me and you. Mm, he didn't do it. it. No, I haven't seen it. We invited him on the show. It's funny, I invited him on the show last time, and he was like, whatever happened to that? And I was like, bro, you can come on the show. Like, we'd love to have a How left podcaster. Uh, B-I-N-D-R. Oh. Okay. And uh, B-I-N-D-E-R. And, and he didn't, didn't get anything from him, and it's been like a week or whatever, so, you know, not surprised. <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, let's grab some more Super Chats. Lightgiver says, Brussels has warned Musk that Twitter must comply with the European Union's new digital rules or face fines or ban. Yes, I'm pretty sure Elon Musk is going to adhere to these rules. I don't think Elon Musk is going to walk in and be like, okay, everybody, um, anyone can post anything right now. Just do it. I kind of disagree. I think he's going to say whatever's legal in the United States is legal on Twitter. And if whatever's legal in whatever state they're incorporated in, which is California at the moment, is now state laws. you got to adhere to state law. Maybe they'll move the corporation to a better state that has better local laws. Ian, let me ask you something. What is the challenge associated with that? Because yesterday on the show, you said it would be difficult to create a policy. And you're mentioning the First Amendment now. Is there some reason the First Amendment will be more difficult to implement than the policies they have now? I'm curious what the pitfalls are as someone who's worked with a social media company before. One of the main ones is that company, countries like Brussels will just not host Twitter now. Mm. Like China, it won't be in, like mines isn't in China. You know, they won't host it because it's a free speech policy. Um, the, the, another downside with having a one, when I call it authoritarian when it's a corporation because they're just inherently authoritarian by nature. But when you have one authoritarian at the top whether it's Elon Musk or any any corporate owner, mm -hmm. they can tell you it's free speech, but then completely just block everything the next day. They don't have to like it here. There's no laws. You know, that's the problem with saying your terms of service are free speech. Mm -hmm. There's no constitution that upholds that. It's the, the will of the, the corporate overlord. So you need to go outside of terms of service to, to really instantiate. I love that word. Third time we said it tonight. Free speech. It, it's got to be enshrined in the code itself that there is Interesting. some way to to take control of the network on your own if you're not happy with the way other people are running it and so, build your own. But Brussels is not for free speech. Mm -hmm. Then they can they can do that on their own, in my opinion. But I, I don't think that we should we should allow countries that are not for free speech to dictate how we run ours. Yeah, I think what will happen is Elon's going to say, OK, in the United States, we have free speech in Europe. You don't. And then people will use VPNs to get to the website anyway, or they'll move to the United States to get out of their totalitarian countries. Their VPNs. Monarchies. People are going to start downloading Virtual Shield. Yeah. Mm, yeah. I wonder how many people <laughs> are using a VPN to watch this show tonight from China. What's up, dudes? Well, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Jesus uh, Crisp. Crisp, Crisp says yeah. Tim Cast, Daily Wire <laughs> and The Blaze are triumvirate of truth. Oh, yes. I mean, there's, there's other people involved in there, isn't there? I love this person. Yeah, what about uh, Joe Rogan? All right, let's see. Katoth Swiss says, but Taylor needs those sweet, sweet victim points, Tim. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. It worked out for her. We got the, hey, Tim Pool's fighting back, and she got the, oh, help, I'm a victim. Everybody wins, right? That's uh, the culture war. Yeah. 
I just, I'm sick of the lies. So, you know, sending a message where it's like, you want to wield institutional power that is the Washington Post, I'll wield institutional power that is a Times Square billboard. Shout out to the, to the Daily Wire for the assistance. All right. The Senate says, and it's a picture of Palpatine. Hey, Tim, you should buy another billboard and talk about Biden's crooked dealings. Here's some cash to get you started. You can't. Political ads are not allowed in most of the Times Square billboards, so you can't do it. Maybe it's not a political ad. Maybe it's just an advertisement for meeting with the big guy. Oh, yeah. That, that is an interesting <laughs> yeah, challenge, yeah. though. Yep. The, uh, when, when Donald Trump was looking into what Biden was doing, they said it was political, but Biden hadn't even announced that he was running for office. He was retired at that point. Also, yeah, what so, an insane standard. But this is what will happen. If, if you go and say, look, I just want to talk about what Joe Biden did, they'll be like, it's political because he's a politician. Yeah, and but, I'm like, but I'm not talking about anything policy-wise. Yeah. I'm talking about criminal activity. I don't like that they call Obama President Obama. Now that he's not president anymore, there's what? like this weird... Um, what does that have to do with what I was talking about? Like you're saying he's always, once in politics, always in politics, and you can't go after him anymore. Like Biden, now that he was vice president, they're like, hello, Mr. Vice President, even when he's out of office. Like it's um, some some weird tradition that we <laughs> refer to old presidents as President Bush or President Obama. I, 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 don't, know, president I don't think anymore. the titles of well, the individual is what matters. What matters is they will make up an excuse to block you from trying to call they're, them They're out. acting also, as if he's still political. I just want to say, you know, Ian, some people are still calling Biden vice president. As Including Obama. Or no, it was <laughs> <Himself>. Biden himself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but no, it, it, what, what an absurd idea, right? If someone's a political figure, you can't investigate them for a crime or that's political. Unless, of course, it's Donald Trump or Marjorie Taylor Greene, then it's, it's fair game. All right. We got this one from JL who says, my kidneys are shutting down and I'm stuck in a hospital bed. Can someone please take over the Ian Shaft cam meme for me, please? Oh, no. <laughs> Get healthy, sir. Get healthy. All right. G Money says, Tim and Ian, check your DMs. I just made a remix of the beautiful Chicken City acapella Tim posted. It's uh, was it Twitter 5420. So I posted an isolated vocal track. We were recording the Chicken City theme song earlier today. Dude, I have some incredible harmonies for that. I'm super. So excited. we were we were tracking the second verse. And so I put the camera up and I, I, I just recorded nothing but me singing and put it up on Instagram. It was like a joke. And the harmonies are so good that I wrote. I think it could be a hit song. Yes, it's incredible. Yeah. This song is about Chicken City, and it's going to be epic. So uh, I played it on my Instagram on the acoustic, and now we're, we're finishing out. It's, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful folk song. Beautiful. All right. Let's see what we got. Amanda Dilt says, today is my son Hunter's fifth birthday. Can you please wish him a happy birthday? He really loves all the voices that Seamus does. Oh, that's, that's adorable. What, uh, what voice should I do? Ben Jordan? Shapiro. Okay. First of all, happy birthday. <laughs> Happy Hunter. birthday to you. Embody the archetypal. How, how old is, is he it turning? Five years old, Hunter. Uh, embody the archetypal five year old. Be yeah. a hero. <laughs> Hunter, that's my brother's middle name. Okay, you got Ben Shapiro name. and Jordan Peterson. What, I else? Have what else? Jack Dorsey. Happy birthday. <laughs> Happy fifth birthday, young man. Trump was. First of all, five was a very good year for me. I hope it's a good year for you too, frankly. Yeah. Quite frankly, it's what I. You probably won't make as much money as I made. It's when I started to amass my fortune. Got a job very early. <laughs> Is that it? <laughs> I don't know. Throw another voice at me. Any voice, any Gotti? voices they want for this kid's birthday. Uh, Gilbert Gottfried. Oh, man. Can I do that? Happy fifth birthday. Oh, is that, wow. Is that, wow. Yeah. Good. Oh, thank good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Rip. Thank you. Rest in peace. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The great Gilbert. All right. Grant Gordon says, Tim, you guys got to go and see and review the new movie out of the Northmen. There's no political agenda. The woke are furious that there's no diverse cast and it's, and it's extremely masculine. It's an awesome. I did go see it. I quite enjoyed it, actually. I, I thought it was really good. Um, what, what, was, what are people saying? It's basically Hamlet, but with Vikings. Yeah, that's what I heard. But it's... Uh, it, it's Where did it's, you see it? Uh, just local theater. Okay. Yeah, up in Frederick. So uh, I thought it was great. Uh, I actually was really uh, enthralled. So, you know, I, I, I determine how, how much I like a movie based on, you know, a few factors. Did I, was I, was I attuned to the film the whole time? That's a big one because there are films with like really great scenes where I like, whoa, and then something happens and I'll be like looking around or I'll be like, I'm going to go to the bathroom. I don't know what's mm -hmm. going on. So this movie, I didn't take my eyes off the screen one time. I was glued to it because it's always something cool happening. I, love movies like I thought it was good. I thought it was good. I don't think the story was like a legendary profound thing, but I remembered everything through it. And there were some really cool moments. So how's it doing overall? Do you think? I don't know, but it's cool. Uh, Alexander Skarsgård plays a Viking berserker. It's really cool. Yeah. It's brutal. Now, it's just, just a question. Yeah. Did you like Yellowstone? I did not watch it. Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't know. I hear it's good, though. I hear it's great, yeah. Yep. 
I should watch it though. But I, I like Northland. Northland North opened with twenty three point five million. In the is that good? It's yeah. definitely not oh. politically correct, yeah. Yellowstone. So. Oh really? Yeah. When uh, when I saw the trailers for the Northman, I was like, I want to see that, like brutal Viking film, and it's just, I dig it. It's a brutal movie. Wow. Yeah, it's cool. The cinematography is incredible too. I lo- I thought it was fantastic. I, I actually I would say this. I would go see it again. It's on my list now. Yeah. There's there's very few movies I would go see twice. I would see that one. I'm not I don't I'm not saying that to make you think that like it's a Lord of the Rings, you know, some epic, but it's just really entertaining. So I'm definitely looking forward to watching it again. And they're saying it's like it's racist, it's all white, it's patriarchal, it's alt right. I'm like, dude, it's just like an it's action, what it was. It's a Viking movie. I don't know. Like, I watched Black or? Panther. I thought it was really good too. Like, and that was an all mostly black cast. Am I supposed to be angry about this stuff? It's just so weird to me, man. All right, all right. Let's see. Uh, what, on what numbers, it says that Northman costs seventy to ninety million to make. Mm. It's ninety million dollars, and that it's only made about twenty-three million in the first weekend. So they anticipate not making the money back on it. Oh boy! But you know that may change. They're saying they don't think they'll make their money back. That's what they get for spending ninety million dollars on a freaking movie. Jeez. And it's kind of crazy because it's a lot of just like outdoors in Scandinavia. And like VR, or not VR, but uh, CG? It's not really. Are there a lot of high A-list actors in it or very popular actors? Nicole Kidman. Mm-hmm. Uh, Willem Dafoe's in it. Oh, yeah. That's $20 million. Yeah. 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 Alexander Skarsgård is, is not that big, but he's he's fairly well-known. He played Magneto at some point, did he? What was that it? Skarsgård played Magneto? Is that the same guy? No, no, no. Skarsgård was, uh, he was, in, he was in True Blood. He was in... His most notable role is he was the male model in Zoolander who sprayed gasoline on. <laughs> That's a great role. All right. <laughs> yeah. Role. I it's forgot cool. about that scene. <laughs> <laughs> That's hysterical. The gasoline fight. <laughs> yep, Do you that ever was think him. there's more to life than being really, really, really ridiculously good looking? I want to watch Zoolander now. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. What is this? A school for ants? <laughs> All right. Morpheus says Twitter now is a down vote system. I'm surprised. Really? Yeah. Really? Did yeah, they implement they that? What did they do yeah. that? Yeah, for only some people, though. Oh. All right, Laughing Dog says only good- Democrats get to be downvoted now in yep. Elon <laughs> Musk's regime. Laughing Dog says good job with the street meme, Timmy, my boy. Very proud of you and your hard work. And shout out to the Daily Wire for making this happen. We are actually looking at Times Square ads, though. Uh, looking at a couple because we have we've got the Tales from the Inverted World book release coming up in a couple months, the new book. So we're gonna do like a big campaign. It's gonna be fantastic, building that culture. Tales from the Inverted World: Ghosts of the Civil War. The coolest thing about it, I think, is not like the ghost stories, the UFO, Bigfoot, or the Lost Gold. It's what I hear from Shane Cashman, our, our reporter, our, our writer, who's meeting all these people from the South, from Georgia, and they're telling him about what went down in the Civil War. And it's just like crazy stuff that you don't hear about. Like one story was when, you know, during Sherman's March to the Sea, when they like ransacked everything, there was whiskey pouring from casks into the street and guys were scooping it up with their hats and just like trying to drink it. Crazy stuff like that. Yeah, cool Wild. stories. Yeah, and they really hate Sherman. Oh, yeah. Are you <laughs> kidding me? <laughs> like, just destroyed everything. Yeah. Like that guy. Yeah, absolutely brutal. Named a tank after him, too. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Let's see. We got Bradley Markham says, I've been watching your report since 2015. Your track record is impeccable. Thank you for what you do. You know, it's, it's simple. Like, when I make, when I do general reporting on the facts, they tend to be correct. Because, you know, they'll, the Covington kids, they come out, they lie about it. I do the digging. I say, here's what happened. I'm right. Predictions, not as much. When I say, because of this, here's what I think will happen. Those are up in the air. Predictions are very hard. Mm. Right. Even when they have lots of information, because there's so many factors that can go into changing the course of events going forward. Mm. And having some, maybe being a little humble, okay? I found that in the intelligence community is very easy for people to report what's going on, to describe things. But they're not very good at predicting. Yeah, and your prediction, yeah. a public prediction, a will point. also alter the course of whatever had been happening just by disturbing the process. Yeah, well, the, and that's true. I think over the past couple of years especially, I've been reluctant to make predictions just because of how insane things have got. But I will say this. The one prediction I've gotten more confident in making is that the media is lying to me. What they're saying <laughs> to me will turn out to be a lie. That prediction I'm always comfortable making. Yeah. All right. The one free man says Twitter just reactivated from when I shared the laptop story. Interesting. Hmm. Also, Ukraine government paying farmers to stop farming. U.S. refuses to ship fertilizers to farms. Canada declares fertilizer worst emissions offender. More processing plant fires. Intentional. 
Perhaps, perhaps. But it's interesting that they shut you down over the laptop and only just released it. Some people have said it's an Enron. Mm -hmm. That right now, Twitter is burning papers, destroying records, destroying code because they don't want anyone to find out what's going on. Well, I mean, it just goes to show you because if what he's saying is true, uh, the laptop story was proven to be true a good while before Elon Musk purchased Twitter. Yep. Yeah, and that code is going to be backed up elsewhere. If people are actually destroying Twitter's IP right now by doing something to code, those people are going to go to federal prison. But the memos, the emails, that sort of thing, you know, people, I think, are fairly certain that they will not be held accountable yeah. at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. They yeah. won't be publicly shamed. They won't be called out. And even if someone tries, it'll be very hard to penetrate the, the media-controlled environment. Yeah, they'll just call it fake news over and over again. They don't really need to cover things up. They just need to shame you for talking about them. All right. Colonel Cornelius Cornwall says, I have like 13 plus videos of Tim talking about corn. I plan on making a corn palation. Tim, please join my corn cult, Cornicultia. Corn be with you. Corn be with you. All We've right. done amazing things with corn. We've made plastics, fuel, popcorn. Sounds sounds corny. Yeah. Syrup. Uh, I tried to lower my chair so I could just sink out of frame when I said that, but it was already <laughs> right. too low. Bardaxilis says, shout out to all the TimCast members. Ten bucks a month is changing culture. Thanks, Tim, for being genuine and transparent. We, uh, uh, we, we try to the greatest degree that we can. And if you become members at TimCast.com, just know we're going to do more stuff like setting up billboards, calling out the BS. And uh, we've got a bunch of other ideas. I call it culture jamming as marketing. I didn't make that up. The idea, the idea is, am I really going to market this company by putting up a billboard where it's like, watch the show? Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe we might, something like that. But what really works is culture jamming, making something that makes people stop and think and say, hey, whoa, challenging the system, calling out liars. That's worth way more than putting up an ad where it's like, buy my book. Hmm. Got to do something. All right, Murph tries. DIY says, Seamus, you need to make Tim's rant of Elon and the Battle of Helm's Deep a freedom tune. I, I, well, now I can't. Uh -huh. Now he's going to be able yeah. to sue me if I do it. Mm -hmm. What? If it's, 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 it's an unsolicited pitch. No. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Um, but I'll tell you what, Seamus. Maybe, maybe I was we, gonna, but now maybe, I can't. Maybe, maybe you just need to figure out a way to get those Fauci roles in these, in these cartoons. Just oh, man. For yeah. some Tim reason. is always is gunning for Fauci because yeah. he pays the bills here. Do I want to animate Nancy Pelosi? No. Do I want to look? <laughs> yeah, I, I just I don't even want to think about her. Maybe we should make a chicken Nancy Pelosi for Chicken City <laughs> cartoons. Pelosi's teeth. All right. Logan Lux says possible right. solution to Twitter censorship. Anything can be posted, but every user is required to tag their post as graphic, gore, etc. And users also filter out their own set of tags they don't want to see. Suspend those tagging inappropriately. I think what um, Minds does is that you have to tag your content. If you don't, you get permanently soft censored, meaning yeah. they put like a blur over your pictures. Over your entire channel, yeah. People have to go there and, and set it. And that's also a great point. Uh, granular search. So basically you can blacklist words that you don't want to see and you can whitelist things that you want to appear up in your algorithm. That's, I think it's a really good way moving forward. Right on. Raymond G. Stanley Jr. says, no crap. Down with crap. And that's critical race applied principles. Completely agree. All right. Jeffrey Pfaff says, Staten Island GOP did the same thing today to John Matland. He was primarying a useless GOP rep. What is that? Militakis? We got all of the required signatures, but the establishment GOP challenged it going to court. Corruption. Not a fan. The Jaded Kriegsman says, Tim, I like the idea of uh, the idea on a boycott, but it's better that people where they can vote in the vote in for populists in 22 and go vote in the primaries, still vote in the general, but only for populist candidates and uh, right abstain for others. Yeah, it's a good point. You should definitely vote for the populists if you can, because if there is a hundred jurisdictions where a populist does win, then the crony establishment will have no power power in the federal government because they, you know, assuming they cheated or whatever. Or like, you know, I mean, by booting people out of the primary. And then you got to take what you can get. Maybe by 2024, they'll have lost all of their institutional power. Murph Try says, what can we do to get Matt Walsh to read Johnny the Walrus to the cast of Chicken City? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how you would keep the chickens 
like watching. It's like an yeah. a la carte thing. They can come and go. Also, they I don't. Well, go. maybe yeah. we're underestimating how engaging this story is. It's very engaging. Mm-hmm. Chickens could pay attention. I haven't read it. Do good. walruses scare chickens? Oh, that's mm. a good question. Probably. Th- but I think out. the real question is, do pictures of walruses scare chickens? Because they might not know the difference. Mm. No, the real question out. is, does Matt Walsh scare chickens? <laughs> yes. Matt Walsh does Definitely. scare chickens. Yeah. Chickens I, are scared of everything. That's why they're know. chickens. Yeah. Roberto, Roberto's, R- beard. R- Roberto's getting pretty tough. Mm. He's, he's, he's challenging people. He and you he think jumped? he could take Matt Walsh? No, but he'll no, try. Not in a one-on-one fight. No, yeah. Walsh would do it to him. Yeah, yeah I think I think Walsh definitely could beat a rooster. Could probably beat the rooster. Yeah, yeah. he could beat a rooster. That's my yeah. hunch. But you're descri- I mean, you're kind of upselling this rooster. You really. What about a goose though? Mm. I don't not know if what Matt Walsh could beat a goose in a fight. No. Yeah, bare goose, is, goose is tough. I hear like tough. a big goose. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, like the biggest. Yeah. The I biggest mean, if he goose. if like he had Knowles backing him up, then definitely not. <laughs> Do you, do you think you could? It would do worse. It would do worse. worse. Oh, wait, worse. Do, you, do you think you could beat a a, a goose, Derek? We have five geese at our place. Oh, oh. tell me about yeah, it. Yeah, and they are mean. Yeah, yeah. they're mean. Okay. How close do, can you get? No, they they chase you. No, okay, yeah. wouldn't chase let, me, let's, let's, I would chase be, a goose. Let, no, look. Obviously, Matt Walsh I would could. Destroy a goose. Matt Walsh could defeat a goose. Could beat He's a goose tough. in a fight. But a gang of geese. No, like five. I think no, he'd have to nervous. run. I'd mess yeah. every one of those geese up. Yeah. What 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 about what is remember that meme? Fight one horse sized duck or a hundred duck sized horses? <laughs> I think you gotta go with the, the small horses. They're more docile. Oh man. I Just don't get behind small them. Horses. There was there was a hysterical study and I can't remember where it was from, but it was basically a survey done comparing the results between men and women when they asked them which animals they could defeat in a fight. It's really good. Oh man, maybe we'll pull it up on the after show. That's I think a I remember teaser that. now. You haven't told us. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You guys are going to have to see the results. Tune, okay. tune on into the after show. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Matthew Miller says, good to hear the spirit of Dave Smith speaking through Seamus. That tax tax talk on labor versus gas sounds familiar. Cheers, all. Has Dave Smith said that? Well, good for him. Dave, you mean you're not going to acknowledge that you ripped off? Dave I Smith? stole it from Dave. You, I, you know, I was watching. <laughs> look, all look. We need to roll back the state. We spy on all of our own citizens. Our prisons are flooded with nonviolent drug <laughs> offenders. Right. If you want to know who we're going to go to war with next, look at who we're, we're funding, funding right now. Yeah. Original Seamus Coughlin quote. Very original. Yeah. All right. Lackles says, we built Chicken City on Bach and Crow. Mm-hmm. Well, okay. Bach. Yeah, it's a song. Darius Harvey says, do you guys have an app yet? Almost. We almost have an app. We're starting with iOS, and then we're going to do Android, and it takes time because, oh, man, things take too much time. They're expensive. So um, become a member at tipcast.com. Orange Red says, what happens to Cast Castle once you move to the new HQ? There will be some production stuff still happening here. Uh, I don't know about the vlog, though. We may have to move that to Free Damastan. Mm. But then what? Is the name mm. Cast Castle and not Free Damastan? I don't know. Mm, I don't know. <laughs> We've got really cool uh, updates on, the, on the, the, the foundation's been laid. They're going to be doing the building soon. We are going to be building. It's going to look so wacky. It's going to be amazing. We got crazy plans. I don't want to release them just yet, but we're going to, one thing we are planning on doing, the internals of the new uh, um, workspace is going to be fully skatable. So like there'll be a picnic bench for it to sit up, sit and work at. Angle iron, grind bars. You can skate on it. You can do whatever. There's going to be a stage. It's also going to be a, a part of a fun box, like a multi-use skate uh, obstacle. And the, the flat can open up to a foam pit. Mm. The bar where you can go get something to drink or cook food, totally skatable. Angle iron, skate light, all that good stuff. The whole thing. It's going to be epic. So during the work day, people are working. And then once work is done, people will throw it on their boards, put on their blades, grab their scooter or bike. And then they're going to be grinding on all their work equipment. That sounds like a good tourist uh, location for people to come. Set up tours. Set up some no, lodging. No one's allowed. Set up lodging. You know, visitors. That would be really fun. And then we'll just, you know, my goal is in 10 years to have massive skyscrapers in the middle of West Virginia. Yes. <laughs> where people are just going to be like, what is going on? Hey, hey. We're, but that means we're going to have tons of new people coming in, bringing in new jobs. And it's going to be it's going to be really cool. When my five-year-old and nine-year-old hear about this, they're going to say, that's where I want to work. Yeah. <laughs> well, we already have a skate park in this house. In the, in the, we have in the basement and we have one in the garage. So the new space is 7,500 square feet, 31 feet tall. 25 on the sides with a 30, 30, 31 foot uh, at the center because of the pitch. We're going to have the studio very much like we do now, but it's going to be on the second floor. It's going to have one wall all glass so you can see the whole 
you know, interior of the building. I hate to bring this up, but what's OSHA say about that? No, it's all fine. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's actually nothing particularly crazy relative to what a lot of companies already do. When I went, like, like Fusion's office had that already. The, the, the mezzanine was like overlooking the entirety of the warehouse building with all the people working on the bottom. Ours is just a particularly smaller version of it. So the, the real issue is how you segment space for who and what work and like how it works for insurance. But I think we'll be able to navigate it just fine. You know, so certain space is allotted to, to certain elements of the business and not to the others. And there's different companies that have different portions and stuff like that. We'll build some stuff outside as well. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. We have this gigantic like 15 foot mound of dirt now for when they excavated. We'll maybe build something. I don't know. All right. Yeah. Underground tunnels, Hobbit House. Earth ships. Be a lot of fun. Yeah. All right. But uh, hopefully it'll, it'll get done. Yeah. Castle is also a verb. So cast castle will be like the moving of the king. Hey, there of you the go. Cast, mm. yeah. All right. Ev style says still looking for sandwich prospects. Sent an email to spin the UFO. Really interested in making sandwiches for you guys. Uh, donut and deli for life. I think we're going to do a coffee shop first because we looked over the cost and we were like, coffee is probably the safest and fastest and easiest way to go. And there's a lot of interesting ideas we could do for it. You know, just undercut Starbucks and put them next to them. And I, uh, I've been inundated with um, people who are excited to make sandwiches for us. So you guys are all displacing me. I'm just kidding. No, I have too many sandwich offers and we'll figure it out. Well, what we need is someone who knows how to run a sandwich shop. We right. don't need someone who's like, those. I've made a sandwich before. We need someone who's like, I know the, the equipment, the machinery, someone who's actually managed it. In fact, we need someone who's probably run one and then we could do it. But, you know, we'll see. Uh, uh, so let's, uh, wait, what? I can't read that super chat, so I'm going to keep going. And, uh, uh, September Thompson says the chicken party needs an animated Tim yelling chicken party. Well, here's the idea. We have an idea for the ultimate chicken party, which is we just recorded the chicken city theme song. And so what'll happen is if 10 chicken parties happen in one day, an ultimate party happens where me and Ian walk in on both sides and Ian's banging the tambourine while we're both playing and singing the Chicken City theme song. That's so good. <laughs> That's so good. Raymond G. Stanley Jr. says, proud of yous. Don't let them down. Forward the line. My friends, if you haven't already, smash that like button. Subscribe to this channel. Share the show with your friends. And head over to TimCast.com. We're going to have that bonus segment, members only, coming up at 11 p.m. And as a member, you are keeping our journalists employed. We hired a new journalist. We're hiring more. And you will uh, allow us to do things like buy billboards. Huh. and challenge the system. So it's greatly appreciated. You can follow us at TimCast IRL, basically everywhere. You can follow me at TimCast. Do you want to shout anything out, Derek? No, I'd just like to thank everyone for letting me join you tonight. I think this is, you know, very quick-witted and a conversation, good insights, uh, very agile thinking, uh, some good comedy. And, oh, uh, thank you. Good impersonations, and I really enjoyed it. I'd love to be back. I'd like to bring my kids to, yeah, see, absolutely. to oh see the compound. This yeah. is fantastic. You when, got a great gig going here. When's the election happening? July 19th, and we need a good turnout. I think the more people that turn out, the better, because we got to get the base out, and we got to go after the establishment candidates and challenge them. Right on. Do you have a website people could check out? VoteDerekHarvey.com. And you can also find me, Vote Derek Harvey, on Facebook. Very cool. Right on. I am Seamus Coughlin. I do cartoons on a YouTube channel called Freedom Tunes. We release a new cartoon every Thursday. We're working on one about Disney losing its special privileges and one about Musk buying Twitter. In fact, there's a good amount of material there. We might do more than one on that topic. Go over there, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and thank you so much for watching. Ian Crossland, guys, thanks for coming out. Uh, check me out on iancrossland.net if you want to get in touch somehow. And come over at timcast.com and check out the after show. See you later. Yeah, I just wanted to say, if you do go to voteforderekharvey.com, there's a really cute picture of him and his little family on their tractor, which is incredible. And I also wanted to say, people have been yelling at me and telling me that the My Pillow guy is back and that the Babylon Bee is back. I haven't seen that the Babylon Bee is actually back. The Mike Lindell account that is back is not a lot of fake accounts being made right now so watch out always do your due diligence and make sure you're spreading the truth making sure that everybody's on the correct page you guys can follow me on twitter we're all going down at sarah patch lids as well as minds.com and at sarah patch lids .me. 
Yeah, a lot of fake accounts that people don't know this. The Timcast account is actually me. It is. Yeah. <laughs> Stay away time. from that yeah. one. Yeah, I'm actually not even on Twitter. Not it's even true. there. Not. So every time he's trending, it's it's, it's actually. actually yes. Seamus wishes he was me on Twitter. <laughs> what? I've got 1.1 million oh, followers. Wow. Well, I have. No, well, I actually, <laughs> I actually, I gained a bunch of followers on my account. Yeah, you did. Uh, like 20,000 today or whatever. Sus. That's because Russia heard Musk bought. Twitter, and now they're sending the bots in. Mm -hmm. ah. That's mm -hmm. it. All right, everybody, head over to TimCast.com, become a member, and we will see you all shortly.